Let's-a-go! Hello and welcome to another episode of Ferris 64 with me, your host, Yemi the Ferret. Ferris 64 is, of course, the one-stop shop for video game news, occurrences, first impressions, and so much more. Uh, today we got uh, Gamescom to talk about, we got uh, the Nintendo Museum, we got Black Myth Wukong, uh, so let's just go ahead and get started. And of course, when there is a major showcase, I usually like to start with those. So let's go ahead and just jump right in <laughs> with uh, what was announced at that game showcase. All right, before we get started, just remember to give the video a like if you're watching on YouTube or if you're on Spotify, leave a leave a rating on Spotify or leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It would I would very much appreciate that. It does help the podcast um, in multiple ways. So thank you so much to anyone who has been liking and or uh, rating the podcast. I do appreciate that. Also, uh, if you are listening to the audio version, I would also appreciate if you just you know just could add a on over to the YouTube channel, put a like on that video because uh, I would also appreciate that as well. Let's get started with Gamescom here. Uh, so Gamescom this year, I thought that it was kind of, um, I don't want to, I don't want to like be, I don't want to be negative off the bat, but I felt like it was kind of like ho-hum, like, okay, here we go kind of things. I don't, I don't think that Jeff Cayley really had enough meat on this, on this, uh, event. Uh, it just, it just seemed like, uh, he was getting, I just, I just felt like it wasn't as strong as, as past years. Um, even like Summer Games Fest with how many showcase you know the showcase for that was also kind of like okay you know i mean it was good but it's not like the greatest thing i've ever seen this one was kind of the same way where it's like it's good but i mean this is definitely not going to go down in history as one of the greatest showcases of all time uh but gamescom did deliver with some things so let's go ahead and get started uh with the first big reveal which was borderlands 4 was revealed now there really wasn't anything going on per se in the trailer um, that they just kind of showed like, hey, two games presents, Gearbox presents. There's a planet which is most likely actually the. It was more of the moon, right? It kind of looked like the moon actually, uh, the moon of Pandora, which had like the crack in it with the with the purple, right? And uh, it just kind of like crashes into some sort of like gem field <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> it's hard to really say exactly what it was, but uh, you know, all of a sudden in the in the in the wreckage there is a. Um, a psycho mask, and then Borderlands 4 appears on the screen. So we didn't really, we don't really know exactly what the heck was going on with this. Um, all we know is a, a robot hand with some long fingernails picked up the Borderlands mask, and then it kind of faded to black. I mean, for a cinematic trailer, it was kind of cool, you know? Uh, what the heck happened to the moon? What the heck happened to, uh, what was her name who lived on the moon there? Judy or something like that. Uh, who knows what happened to to all those people who lived on the moon? But this thing crashed into some ice or or crystals in the in space and whatever. Uh, there was also like the phoenix. You know how uh, Lilith had like the the firehawk symbol uh, that also appeared for a brief moment on screen as well. So it's not like they were hiding what the game what you know what this was before they revealed that it was Borderlands Four. Um, but it was hard to tell, like, okay, is this something new? Is this something more like the pre-sequel? Is this something more like a, t a Telltale adventure like they've been doing with, like, some of those offshoots? Is it going to be something completely different? No, but it's Borderlands 4. Uh, I'm still waiting for the Borderlands RTS game. <laughs> every every series has at least one. Gears of War, uh, for, uh, Halo, um, you know, all, all, there's, a, there's a few different ones out there that you could name that just randomly have RTS games attached to them, but... And uh, I guess they revealed what it's, it's going to be out in 2025. Um, it's going to be across all the newer systems, no older systems. Uh, it would be on Steam, Epic Store, PlayStation, and Xbox. So I don't really have anything to speculate about it. Um, I wasn't, like, super crazy about the last game, even though I did put it on my top ten list the year that came out. 
on replays and just kind of thinking about it as I was playing through it. I, I was not as super into it as I thought I was, or I, I, or I was. I, I was way more into it. Um, but the lack of unique bosses and the story itself just was... It started to amo- annoy me more and more. So hopefully I do a better job with this one. Uh, hopefully it's better than the Borderlands movie. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet, but uh, those review scores don't help it too much. Now, I know that there is a bit of like a hate train on on some things here. You know, like I'll, I'll talk about Concord later, obviously. But um, I, I do think that it's easy to believe that the Borderlands movie is bad. I'll, I'll just wait for it on a, like a digital storefront. Um, but... Uh, that would be that. Let's move on to... I, I'm hoping that these are in order. I'm just kind of on a random website here. Uh, I'll, I'll shout it out since I'm actually... Since I'm using it. It's uh, Mashable.com. Shout out. Uh, Dying Light the Beast. So Dying Light the Beast was originally supposed to be a DLC ended up becoming a full game. And uh, the guy from the first game named uh what's his face uh kyle that doesn't sound right oh it was it, kyle crane i was right uh kyle crane he is apparently back for this one as the t- titular beast they're going hashtag crane is back i don't know how many people like super loved kyle crane you know uh, i mean he was a he was a decent character but i wouldn't say that he was like a super fan favorite i mean you know there was a noticeable like lapse of him not being there in in the second game obviously but um yeah it looks like they're combining uh some more of that like you know gameplay where you turn into like the monster or whatever you want to call it i accidentally played it there <laughs> uh some of the video there um but uh yeah you know um i mean the trailer looked cool and I'm sure I'm hoping that the game is not going to be like uh, you know a seventy dollar experience. If they make it more like a forty dollar experience, especially if it was supposed to be a DLC, then yeah, there you go. Um, it's also interesting to note that this is not Dying Light Two: The Beast. This is just Dying Light: The Beast. So I also think that is in- an interesting choice there as well. Um, it'll be about twenty hours of gameplay. There will be a new open world zone to do parkour in, four player co op, but it can be played solo. Uh, there is no release date or pricing yet, but it will launch on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. Sid Meier's Civilization 7 got a release date. It is coming next year on the 11th of February, which is not too bad, pretty early on. Uh, the, the gameplay that they showed off so far does um does not irk me um i know there's a couple people who are like oh i'm out um but the, personally i don't i don't i don't i don't really see a problem with the gameplay so far now i haven't really i mean i only skimmed the gameplay demo that they did uh but it seems like they are going with a style that's more like accessible to new coming players maybe um which i think is a good idea but it also does make it like oh well you know, here here I am playing the seventh game. I've been with the series since the beginning or whatever. You know, if you're that old, um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that I think that giving people a new starting point is a good thing. Although I do feel like Civilization Five is also a good starting place. I mean, that's that's where I started with the series, and uh, I kind of went kind of back and forth with Civilization Five. Then I went to Four. Then I went to that um, Beyond Earth game. I think it was called. Uh, it was all set in space, which I thought was kind of cool. I, I know that game kind of had it had its detractors, but I thought that uh, Sid Meier's Beyond Earth game was was pretty cool. And then uh, Civilization VI came out, and I wasn't like super into that one, but I, I played a, a fair amount of it. But uh, you know, I, I I haven't binged a Sid Meier's game in quite some time. Uh, Civilization V, obviously, I have like I, I feel like I have like. I don't even know how many hour, how many hours I would have in that. Probably thousands, honestly. I played that so much with my friends back in the day, and um, everyone that I knew, I was like, "You gotta get Civilization Five. We can play Civilization Five together." And it was, in, you know, it, it's it's it, it is a little bit tough to learn because there's a lot of systems going on. But um, once you learn it, it's it's smooth sailing. And um, you know, I think Civ Five just had the best gameplay loop in general. I know there's some people who also say that Civ Four was better, but 
I personally like five more, but maybe that's just because I'm a little bit biased because that was my first one. I don't know. Anyway, I am interested in seeing more about Civilization Seven, and um, I may I may pre-order. I may not. Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, good. Uh, you know, a thing to note on here is they are planning for a version on console. I don't know if it's going to be releasing the same day as the PC version, uh, but there is planned to be a PS4, a Xbox One, and a Switch version along with a Steam, Epic Game, PS5, Xbox Series X version. So we'll see how that goes. Indiana jo- Okay, this is definitely not in order. Indiana Jones and the Great Circle had a a, a trailer. Uh, they also showed that the release date for the game is December 9th, coming to Xbox and Xbox games for PC. I think this game is looking pretty good. I know there's some people who are a bit iffy on it, but I feel like if they're if they're if they're trying to capture the essence of what Indiana Jones is, I feel like they're doing an, a pretty good job with this game right now. Uh, obviously, I would I want to play it before I fully judge it. Obviously, I don't want to I don't want to sit here and go, oh, it's going to be the best game ever because I. I don't know because I haven't put, had my hands on it, right? Um, but I I do have high hopes for it uh, because you know I, I do enjoy Indiana Jones and I think what they've shown off has been good. After that initial like, oh, why is it in first person? Uh, kind of like, oh, I got to get used to that kind of thing. Um, I think that uh, it it will be a good time, and it seems like there are third person sections in the game. Uh, namely, like when you're climbing and 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 doing stuff. So hopefully, it's like. I, I I was really hoping like oh you know maybe 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 they could do like a uh, um like a, oh when you're just walking around in the world third person but when the action starts first person that'd be kind of cool uh, the pre order bonuses are were shown off as well if you pre order the game on Xbox uh, you can get the traveling suit outfit and the lion tamer whip. Um, and then they also revealed during this showcase that the game will be coming to PlayStation in spring of 2025. Uh, so Phil Spencer, if you recall, said that Starfield and Indiana Jones were never going to gum- come to PlayStation or other platforms. And yet here we are sitting on the precipice of Indiana Jones now being announced for the PlayStation, uh, which obviously... People who are diehard Xbox fans are going to get a bit miffed about um, ab- about this news because guess what? Now my Xbox console is not the only place to play Indiana Jones, and now in in less than a year after this game's release, you'll be able to play it on other platforms, mainly PlayStation, which was Xbox's biggest rival. Um, so Phil Spencer did come out about uh, this whole thing. He probably anticipated that there was going to be some backlash again, ag- about this. Uh, so he said in a comment, he said, I think as an industry right now, there's a lot of pressure in the industry. It's been growing for a long time. Now people are looking for new ways to grow. Us as fans, us as players of games, we, have, uh, we just have to anticipate there's going to be some change in some of the traditional ways that games are built and distributed. That's going to change. It's going to change for all of us. But the end result has to be better games that more people can play. If we're not focused on that, I think we're focused on the wrong things. So for us at Xbox, the health of Xbox, the health of our platform, the health of our growing games, the the most important things. Uh, so I, I, what I see from that is, hey, we spent a lot of money, and we need to recoup those losses. And Redfall didn't do it for us for... Uh, you know, for as for how long that game was in development, and Starfield obviously didn't do it for us because that was an Xbox exclusive, and you could play it gate day one on Game Pass. Uh, so now they're thinking Call of Duty Six, Black Ops Six is going to be the breadwinner, and probably this Indiana Jones game once it is available on multi multiple platforms. Um, I don't necessarily think this is a bad thing. I know there's a lot of people who are like, "Oh my God, it's the end of the world. Xbox is going to become like Sega." I mean, Sega's been doing fine since it stopped doing the console stuff, but I think that Xbox at least being there to be a bit of competition for the PlayStation is always going to be a good thing. Uh, You think about how the PlayStation and Xbox used to butt heads, especially in the PS4 and Xbox One era. I mean, the PlayStation 4 only sold as well as it did because it literally 
that they came out on stage and they were like, "Well, you can share your games. Uh, you, you know, you, know, you can buy, you can, you can, you can, you can buy used games and play them on the console. It doesn't have to be hooked up to the internet twenty four seven. There's no camera, you know, that needs to be plugged in for it. You know, that there's no TV access unless you buy download an app. You know, so everything that Xbox said about the original, you know, the Xbox One." Uh, they were like, nope, not that. And I think PlayStation has kind of been cheeky like that their their entire you know their entire uh, tenure because even back in the day with the two ninety nine um, you know you know one sentence uh, show showcase during like E three whenever you know obviously that that goes down in in the annals of history. Um, so I think having Xbox there to at least be um, ch- you know someone to do duke it out with PlayStation because. I mean, say what you want, but Nintendo, they're in their own space. They release their consoles whenever they want to release them. They release their games only on their platform. Obviously, Nintendo knows what they're doing. They make tons of money because of that. And at this point, PlayStation has their exclusive games, but they also work with a lot of other companies. And Xbox has their games, and they also work with a lot of companies. But the problem is that Xbox games seem to be more and more becoming less exclusive. Maybe that's not a problem per se, but I can see a lot of people going, I've been an Xbox fan from day one. I've been an X- I've been there through it all. And now Xbox seems to be just giving out its games to everyone. And it's not even giving us the games first for, you know, some, for some reason, even though, you know, you will be playing Indiana Jones first to, to loop back around. Um, but, uh, you know, games like Black Ops 6 is coming to all platforms on the same day, and once again, this might be something that's just written into their contract with the FTC, is like, hey, we need to see your games being put on other platforms so you don't have a monopoly, because when they acquired Activision Blizzard, they acquired a lot of studios, they acquired a lot of IPs, they acquired a lot of games, a lot of high-selling IPs like Call of Duty and Warcraft and Overwatch and all, all these different IPs that they grabbed. And, um... Whether they do something with all those IPs or not, it's still yet to be seen. But as of right now, I feel like there is a there is a reason, and I think it's because it's either because it's it's in something that the FTC put into law for them, or it's the fact that they spend a lot of money. They've been having to close down studios, and in order to get that money back, they can't just release the game on their ultimate tier for Xbox anymore. They gotta also be like, well, we gotta think about it. Put it on PC. Put it on, you know. Put, they've, been, they've been putting games on Switch as well, like the you know Sea of Thieves and Grounded and stuff like that. But they've also said, hey, we also got to go to our competition and try and sell our games on the com- on the competition's consoles. Boom, bada bing, Indiana Jones, Sea of Thieves, Call of Duty Black Ops Six, all coming to all those different consoles. And um, I don't think there's anything that you're going to be able to do with it uh, about it. Uh, it's probably just going to be the way that things are, and maybe this will be a, a future thing, like, okay, all of a sudden Xbox is out of the console game, or maybe this is just a, a Band-Aid part of their era where they're like, hey, we realize we don't have the money to not have our games on other consoles, so let's go ahead and put them out there, allow people to get them on their consoles of choice, recoup some of that lost assets, and then we can go back to our main mission, which is making sure that all our games are exclusive on Xbox and or Xbox for PC, Xbox Game Pass for PC, and getting stuff out there. So um, that's my thoughts, and obviously that's just speculation. Um, but uh, let me know what you think down in the comments below. Uh, Marvel's Rivals is officially going to launch on December 6th, with all heroes being free to play which is obviously different from how Overwatch 2 is. Uh, So if you don't know, uh, Marvel's Rivals is kind of like an Overwatch clone per se. It's funny that this is releasing so close to the Great Circle. Uh, It's only about three days away. Um, But uh, they decide to, you know, finally put it out there. Um, I'm trying to see here. So it is on Steam, PlayStation, Xbox, and Epic Store, all those places. It will be free to play. I'm pretty sure there's probably going to be some sort of like game pass or something like that coming eventually probably some cosmetics in there that you got to buy in the gamescom trailer they showed off uh captain america and the winter soldier who were kind of duking it out a little bit in the in the cinematic trailer and then in the real trailer they showed off that uh, uh the winter soldier has like an arm that can grapple onto people and pull yourself close to them he also uses a pistol which i feel like is kind of weird because his character has been depicted with a an assault rifle in a lot of different mediums for a long time but maybe you know just to 
maybe the underpower his character. I don't know. They're they're bringing out a pistol there. Uh, Captain America obviously uses a shield a lot. He can you know, essentially absorb damage with the shield and throw it. Um, he does not have a gun or anything, but he has a couple of smash moves and 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 powerful moves. He also has a. It seems like some sort of shield blast they can do as well. And I'm guessing that that would also be like, you know, in in conjunction with like Thor, you can do like a, a combo attack, a team attack. So. Um, <clears throat> I'll definitely be playing this day one simply because it is free to play. Uh, as for hero shooters, I'm not like the hu- uh, a huge fan of hero shooters, but I'll, I mean, if it's free and I, you know, I, I, I'm feeling it. Sure. I'll, I'll play it for a little bit. We'll see how it goes. Uh, uh, or if I if I I'm, uh, if I'm not feeling it, I'll just mark it as beaten and and move on. <laughs> uh, but that's coming December six, like I said. Uh, keep it in line with like the uh, kind of like Marvel stuff. Uh, there is going to be a new series on Amazon Prime called Secret Levels. Um, and the reason why I say this is kind of Marvel esque is, is because all these studios are coming together, Avengers like, and creating some sort of like. A massive uh, game, like each each game has has an episode uh, for each uh, for each episode. So um, so in the trailer they showed a couple of different games like uh, God of War, Space Marines, um, Journey to a Savage Planet. I think um, it looks like possibly Prince of Persia there for a second. I'm not sure. Maybe Star Wars Outlaws as well, and and Sifu for sure. Uh, there's a, it's it, it, it's it's hard to say exactly how you know what some of these games are that they showed off. I'm sure there's a list somewhere. Here it is, right below. Uh, so Armored Core, Concord, Crossfire, Dungeons and Dragons, Exodus, Honor of Kings, Mega Man, New World, Atria, Atrium, Pac Man. PlayStation is bringing in a couple of different uh, entities from their PlayStation studios, like Kratos and I'm not sure who else. Sifu, Splunky, The Outer Worlds, and Unreal Tournament. So those are all going to be the games featured. I'm guessing there's going to be one game per episode, and there's supposed to be 15 animated stories inside of this. So this is going to be on Amazon Prime, and this will be available on December 10th to start watching, which is uh, pretty nice. So uh, I I will be checking that out because it seems pretty cool. Um, kind of crazy that they're already doing like a Concord episode, but hey, get the get get get, get that bread, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, Mafia: The Old Country had a teaser. This was actually the last thing they teased. I'm pretty sure. Um, essentially, they started. Uh, you know, they were kind of just panning around uh, an, an old looking house with you know several like painted por- portraits. There was Cain and Abel and and, and Jesus on a cross. Uh, there's a knife stabbed into a table, and a guy comes out, and he's looking over. Mm, it's Italy, yeah. and uh, I can do that because I'm Italian, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, he's looking out over uh, a city in Italy, and it says "Mafia: The Old Country." Uh, so we're gonna be getting some sort of like mafia game that is set in the older days, which is kind of cool. I, I think that's a really cool idea. Um, and you can wishlist it now, and there will be more information coming in December. So I'm guessing the game's going to launch early 2025 or sometime during 2025. But, uh, yeah, I, I am I am pretty interested in that. Um, I know that Mafia 3 wasn't well-received. I think that that game had struggled with the long term because the start of the game is really good, and then you kind of get to, like, that middle section where it just kind of meanders around. Um, but, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see how this one goes. I, I'm, I'm sure they've been working on this one for a while, and I'm very interested to see how that, how that looks. Uh, we had a look at a game called Masters of Albion. Uh, this is coming from the same guy who did um, uh, the Fable trilogy. Um, so it's, it, it, looks like, it, o- it almost looks like a VR game where you're like the overlord and you're like moving pieces around. Um, but essentially, uh, you have this little town that you that you build up, and you can cur- it's, it's it's almost like Age of Empires where you create a character and you can have them go do tasks. And then, you, unlike Age of Empires, you can actually control that character and start using them out in the world. And you can also, of course, do your own thing because you are still an entity who can manipulate things on the board. Uh, so, you know, you can like use a flamethrower, or you can pick pick your guy up and move him around so that he's not so he's out of danger. Uh, something like that. Um, uh, they said something about it being kind of like the black and white series or populist games, which is kind of cool. Other than that, um, apparently it was a self-funded game coming from the Fable developer. 
Um, and uh, obviously, this is, I mean, it must be a, a passion project if he's if he's going into it with his own money. It seems okay. We'll, uh, of course, look for more gameplay in the future. Dune Awakening had a pretty nice trailer. Um, the one thing that always I come back to is, wow, that looks really cool. I just wish that it wasn't an MMO. I'm not really that big into MMOs. I've never really been that big into MMOs. Maybe this is the one that, that uh, you know, makes me go, oh, wow, that'd be kind of cool. Um, but uh, I don't know. So far, like, yeah, it has some cool stuff in there, but I'm not, like, super jazzed about it. The one thing that really irks me about this trailer is they show a guy walking over in the open sands, and he's not doing the, the walk of the freeman. He's not walking like a freeman. And, um... A worm comes out of nowhere because he's been walking across the sands. Then they then they they kind of pan over and they show him walking on the sand again, and this time he just walks up to a guy and exchanges weapons with him. So I, I don't know what the heck that is. Is is it a real time event where if you're walking over open terrain in the desert you get attacked by a sandworm randomly, or is it just like oh that's the sh- that's just for the trailer? Um, but essentially, you know, it, it, it's got some base build in there. You can obviously it's got tons of crafting so you can craft like a thropter or a, or, a, or a hover bike or whatever it is. And then I guess there's uh, battles for these areas where there's uh, tons of spice. So you essentially have like tanks and, and, and soldiers everywhere and you're trying to, uh, you know, claim the spice. And at the end of it all, it looks like the, uh, the a sandworm, a massive sandworm comes out and, and devours the battlefield after some time i would suppose it's, it's probably an open world event um this is coming early 2025 to pc uh xbox and playstation re- release dates are coming at or the announcement for the release dates are coming at a later date so you know i i like the dune series i've been reading the book the first book and it's 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 pretty good it's it's, it's a brick to get through because there's a lot of you know in the movie they you know, they can kind of gloss over some things just because you can kind of like you know, infer some things from just the the visuals and like panning and, and, and narration. Um, in the book, you know, they he, he, you know the author really went into quite some detail with some things that makes them for for some uninteresting chapters. But for the most part, it's a very interesting read. Um, and with the second movie out now, you know, I'm sure that the the hype is at an all time high for a Dune game. Unfortunately, though, this one does not seem to be one that's going to really capture my attention. Um, I may if there if there's like a um, a trial period for it like you can try it out for like 24 hours or something like that i will totally try it out but i don't think it's going to be a game that i'm going to like super be crazy about but then again i you know I, I i do like to try every genre that i can multiple times so it's not like i'm against entirely against even trying it but i'm not going to go out and spend full price on it is the thing that i'm, I'm trying to say one of the most disappointing things about Gamescom, well, maybe not Gamescom, but just but one of the most disappointing things is that the new Batman Arkham game is not coming to like PSVR or, you know, Steam either. It's not coming to Steam. So Batman Arkham Shadow is coming to only MetaQuest Three. They showed off a trailer for for some gameplay, and the game does look fairly good the arkham game the arkham vr game that was on the PlayStation vr one was decent enough i mean it's a bit bare bones but it was decent enough and this one obviously is like a full-fledged like walk around adventure grappling hook gliding beating up thugs and stuff uh the game is set between arkham origins and arkham asylum so it's also got a nice little placement there of like oh we don't really know exactly what happened during you know between these two things um, they also like to do that so they can probably use the Joker again without him being sick, obviously. But it seems like uh, the combat system looks pretty cool. I'm, I'm kind of watching the video right now just to describe it. But essentially, you know, you're playing in first person, and obviously you don't have peripherals uh, in the VR world. Uh, so it gives you like a little indication that someone's about to attack you from that side, so you can look at them and dodge and then and do countering a counterattack on them. Also, it seems like there's a button somewhere on your headset that you can use to turn on your detective vision. Obviously, you can pick up things and manipulate them in your in your hands and stuff like that. Um, I'm sure there's going to be like Riddler things to find as well, which is a staple of every Arkham game at this point, even Suicide Squad Kills the Justice League. And they also showed off that, yes, there is stealth in the game, and you will be able to go up behind someone and choke them out. I don't know if you actually act, have to use your controller and choke them out like that. I don't know, but it would be kind of funny if you did. Um, obviously this game is all based around the rat catcher so that kind of solves that kind of solves my question about you know oh if it's the rat catcher 
you know, he died in Arkham City, apparently. So where are they, where is this going to fit? Is it going to be after Arkham Knight? Is it going to be after Arkham City? Well, with it being between Arkham Origins and 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 um, and Asylum, that means that yeah, you can use the Rat Catcher again. And the Rat Catcher was in one of the. I've, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. In the in one of the riddles, you can find there's like a mask inside of a. Um, inside of like an air vent near the Joker's fun house, you know, it says that, you know, the rat catcher was dragging, you know, c- captured and dragging and screaming into the Joker's fun house, never to be seen again. So you can only assume that he died. So it's cool. It'll be cool to see the rat catcher here. Uh, the, I, I also paused it on this section. You can see that um, the vent- ventriloquist with a, a very rudimentary looking scar face is, sta- is, is sitting on a chair. I I'm not sure who's in the middle there or on the right, but uh, I'm, I'm sure there are two other, characters that we know and love also it seems like harley quinn's gonna have a bit of a role in this one uh a guy who kind of looked like the executioner um is here but the executioner died in arkham origins so you know it's obviously not him but he kind of looks like him so maybe it's like his brother or something i don't know and uh the rat catcher himself i mean he's he, he's got a nice design to him i think he actually has a nice design to him it'll, it'll be interesting to see what this game is all about it's just so unfortunate that this game is just going to be for the place to, um i'm sorry just for the meta quest 3 uh that's a very niche s- system quote unquote i don't i mean it's it's a it's obviously a very high price point you, I mean, I, I, I just, I, I have a, a, an Oculus Quest like one, but I, I highly doubt that it'll work on that system. You know, so that's the, you know, I, I have no way of playing this unless I go out and buy, you know, the, 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 the two thousand dollar Meta Quest three. I really don't want to do that. That's a lot of money to spend on stuff like this. And I have a PlayStation VR two. Just put it out on PlayStation VR two. I don't know why. I, I mean, I don't know why this is being exclusive to the Oculus. Well, I guess I can tell you. It's it's because it's coming from Oculus Studios. But why WB gave Oculus Studios the the IP instead of whoever did the uh, original Batman Arkham VR game, um, I, I I can't tell you. But uh, I looks. I mean, the 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 thing that irks me the most is that this looks really good. It looks really fun. It's a jump back into the Batman Arkham universe, which is going to be a crutch for WB for a long time now. And uh, it's just it's so unfortunate that. It's going to be probably a limited release, and it's probably not going to sell as well because it's simply just on the MetaQuest 3. So it's coming in October, though. It's coming October 2024. If you have an Oculus Quest 3, boom, bada, bing, there you go. Uh, there was a new trailer for Monster Hunter Wilds. I'm not, like, super crazy about this series, but uh, if you liked these games, I showed off some new uh, big giant enemies, like a big spider-type enemy, a giant bear-type enemy. There was also um, a little bit of, like, oh, here's, like, the world that you explore. Here's the city that you explore. There was also, like, a lightning dragon with wings or something like that. Uh, you know, a lot, I mean, they, they, I mean, this game looks like they put a lot of work into it, a lot of effort into it, so... I'm sure it'll be a blast for people who love uh, Monster Hunter games. The game will release in 2025. Lost Records, Bloom and Rage. This is coming from the same studio that did the original Life is Strange. Don't nod. Obviously, um, I believe the rights were sold to another, to, um, who is it? Uh, Square Enix. Or either that or they broke off from Square Enix. But, uh, you know, compared to the last game that this studio put out, the graphics are actually pretty crazy. Like, the scene where you're sitting down and talking to the person right in front of you in, like, a diner looked fantastic. The scene where they're kind of, like, all gathered around with their guitars and stuff also looked really good. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm, very ex- I'm actually very interested to play this. Um, there's also seems to be some sort of, like, you know, pull up a camera kind of like an outlast where you can pull up a camera at any point and record things. And, um, I think that's also a really good idea. Um, it, it looks good. I'm sure the soundtrack's going to be bumping as well. Um, it's probably not going to be a game for everyone, obviously, but there is the, you know, they, they were, you know, there is a bit of a, of a, a supernatural thing going on to this game. So I'm sure that'll pique some people's interests. Um, it does look like it might be, a little bit episodic because tape one comes out February 18th and tape two comes out March 18th. So I'm wondering if they're doing like a two part release for this, which is kind of weird. Um, that, that era of gaming kind of, you know, kind of came and went at this point, but, uh, yeah, it's coming to PC, PlayStation five and Xbox series X. And, uh, we'll wait to see more about this. It, It is weird that they're releasing it in two episodes. That is very weird, but the game does look good. I think they did it. I think visually they're doing a great job with this one. 
Um, apparently, they haven't uh, they haven't made a game since Life is Strange. So that's uh, that's that's kind of crazy. Or maybe I'm reading this wrong. Eh, whatever. I'll leave that in, but I, I'm probably wrong about that. Okay, um, this was actually early on in the in the event, so I apologize if this is out of order. But Black Ops Six had a campaign uh, showcase, I guess. They kind of showed a bit of a campaign mission where you go kind of undercover, I guess, to some sort of convention, and um, uh, you know, John, John, uh, what's this? Bill Clinton. I'm sorry, Bill Clinton is there. Not John F. Kennedy. I was going to say John F. Kennedy. That's 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 the original Black Ops. Uh, but Bill Clinton is there, and you're like taking photos of people, and you're trying to you know find out where the uh, secret operative is or whatever, getting some blackmail, I guess. I don't know. Um, but uh, that's that's the main thing there. And then uh, you go like behind the scenes, and there's a bunch of dead bodies, and there's apparently like a terrorist organization in there, and the one guy from Black Ops Five is, is it five? Yeah, the guy from Black Ops Five is back, and. He's like, oh, yeah, hey, what's up, y'all? Um, and they also showed off that there's a juggernaut in the game and blah, 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 blah. So, you know, it, it, it's your normal Call of Duty schlock, really. But uh, it just, it looks, I mean, the visuals look great. The gameplay looks fine for, for, for what it is. I mean, I enjoyed Cold War, it, the campaign for that. And I also enjoyed the multiplayer. I thought the multiplayer was pretty good, too. So I'll probably play this for a while. It's just, um, I'll, you know, it's just kind of one of those things that... Uh, Call of Duty is kind of like one of those uh, games that I um, it's it's it, it's my uh, guilty pleasure every single year. Uh, even though I don't always buy them every single year, I usually do get you know at least you know get each Call of Duty eventually, whether it's on sale or whether it's day one. Uh, the other goofy thing is they showed off like a a remote controlled throwing knife where you throw the throwing knife and you can kind of control it and then it explodes. Just just goofy things. Um, you know, obviously some fan favorite things in there as well, like at the RCXD and blah blah blah. Um, and the entire level ends with a motorcycle chase, which I'm sure is very bombastic. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, for, you know, for Black Ops 6, it doesn't look bad, you know, for the game that's coming after Cold War. I feel like they need to stop with the Black Ops naming convention and just do stuff like Call of Duty Cold War or Call of Duty Black, you know, Black Ops, uh, you know, with, with another, with another name underneath it, because I just feel like it's getting kind of ridiculous, you know, back in the day when it was like Black Ops 1, Black Ops 2, woo! And then it's like Black Ops 3, Black Ops 4, Black Ops Cold War, it's like, okay, here we go, um... The same thing's happening with, like, Modern Warfare as well. It would be in, like, the, you know, Modern Warfare 6 if they didn't reboot the series, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, I think the gameplay looked fine. I'm not, like, going to be... I'm, I'm, it's, I'm, I'm going to be playing the game because I have Xbox Ultimate. But um, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it is. And, um, oh, the other thing I want to mention is that the people who came on stage to talk about Black Ops 6 were not very personable. They, uh, they, um... <laughs> They were very monotone, and they didn't seem to be very interested in what they were talking about. All right, a bit of a surprise announcement. Goat Simulator Remastered. The original Goat Simulator is getting a remastered version. Uh, there were a couple of things that um, they kind of harkened back to. like uh, They had like the Arkham intro, and then they also had the Skyrim cart coming by, and they also had uh, some old niche... like. I don't even remember what it was from, like War, War, like War, um, Warcraft reference. They also had like a GTA reference in there as well. And in the end, it was just the Goat Simulator, you know. And uh, personally, I played I played Goat Simulator back in the day, and I don't. Yeah, this was one of those. This was one of those reveals that I was like, "We really doing this? We're really doing this?" Uh, but here we are, Goat Simulator remastered. Uh, that will be out sometime, uh, what, next year, probably? Coming, actually, no, it's coming 2024. It's coming across all systems, so there you go. And I guess, um, I guess that was it for the, the big reveals from Gamescom. I know that there were a couple other things, like, in the, uh, uh, let me see here, in, like, the, um, like the pre-show, like there was a game called Croak, which looks pretty good, where you play as like this toad that's trying to become a prince again, and it's kind of got platforming like Celeste, except you use your tongue to grapple grapple onto um, surfaces and stuff like that. I'm trying to look at a different list to see if um, to see if I can find the pre-show stuff. 
Okay, so other things announced during the showcase as well, pre and post. Uh, Dave the Diver is is doing a collab with both Bellatro and Potion Craft, so that'll be interesting to see what that's all about. Also, Sniper Elite Resistance is coming in 2025. This is a game based um, in, of course, the war in France during World War II. I know that we had Sniper Elite 5, which was also based in France, but this one seems to be based in the occupation of France instead of the invasion of France. It looks like there's going to be some, like, not just sniper combat in there. Um, sort of like how the VR game was. The VR game was a kind of like a mix of, like, um, sniping and, like, regular stuff. Another game called Begone Beast is coming to early access. Uh, seems like a top-down roguelite experience. Uh, that's coming in February 2025. Uh, there's a game called Nico Derico: The Magical World, which is a platformer, kind of kind of like an old-school platformer where you you you, you get uh, gems and letters to form a to form a word, and you go through things um, very fast. Uh, that's coming in October. Seems actually pretty good. Um, and Toria had a thingamajiggy. Um, Karen, which is a climbing kind of game, uh, very much rem- reminiscent of uh, Justant from last year. Uh, but uh, one, you know, this one looks a little bit more hardcore. I think we already saw that before. A horror game called We Harvest Shadows is a farming horror game. So you, you're on this like farm, and there's like spooky things everywhere. There's a demo on Steam available right now. Revenge of the Savage Planet was also shown off. Uh, this is a sequel to uh, the other game called um, Journey to a Savage Planet. So that that's coming. It looks relatively the same. Uh, a game called Directive 8020 is a sci-fi horror game, kind of in the same vein as your Callisto Protocol or Dead Spaces. Looks kind of interesting. Um, they showed off Terry Bogard in Street Fighter VI a little bit. It looks okay. Uh, they also had a little trailer for episode Igus for Persona 3 Reload. Not sure about that. Uh, King of Meat was announced. This is a game where you build your own dungeons, I guess, and you try and, and people try and finish them, kind of like uh, what you might call. Uh, kind of like um, Meet Your Maker from, uh, I think that was last year. I, I enjoyed that game. Uh, another game called No Room in Hell 2 was shown off. Uh, this is a zombie game. I'm not sure what exactly it is. It kind of looked like a Left 4 Dead for a little bit there, but obviously it's not. Uh, Arc Raiders is coming in 2025. This this was shown off at a PlayStation State of Play a long time ago, so uh, that's the new place that we're at now. With that, Infinity Nikki had a new showing. Uh, this was originally showed off at a State of Play as well, and it is a PlayStation exclusive and Epic Store exclusive. Also, it's coming to Google Play Store and I and uh, and the Apple Store. Um, but this uh, is looking like a really bizarre, crazy adventure. Uh, not a game for me per se, but looks decent. Um, also, the new game from Ta- Tarzier Studios called Reanimal was shown off, uh, which kind of just looks like a, a little nightmares game, but it's a bit more gory, I guess, a bit more um, animal animal centered. Uh, you can wish list that now. They also showed off a trailer for Little uh, Little Nightmares Three, which also looks pretty good. They announced that Genshin Impact is also coming to the Xbox Series X on November twentieth. Who knows what happened to the Switch version of that game? But uh, there you go. Um, what else is in here? Fatal Fury: City of the Wolves is coming April twenty fourth. I believe this is a re-release or remaster of a, another Fatal Fury game. That one looks pretty good. Uh, Monument Valley, this is a exclusively Netflix game. An exclusive Netflix game coming December 10th. Uh, looks like a puzzle game where you move and shift the environment to work your way through. Um, Starfield's Rev 8 update is free, and it's actually already available now. Uh, this is the update that adds a vehicle that you can use, which is a very good idea. Also, the Shattered, Shattered Space DLC is coming September 30th officially. A game called Herding, Hurdling, Hurdling, is coming in 2025. It looks like a game where you play as like this uh, dude who herds animals, some various animals, and you try and get them to different places. Looks okay. Um, ba, 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 ba. Squid Games Unleashed. This is also coming to Netflix as well. 
It doesn't look that good, but uh, what what do you expect from a Squid Games game? Uh, uh, well, I mean, I do expect a little bit more from a Squid Games game. I mean, it looks like Fall Guys, except you use like these generic characters. Um, the guy with the with the golden mask also looked kind of terrible, in my opinion. Uh, a game called Arena Breakout Infinite was shown off. This looks like a multiplayer hardcore experience. Early access is available now, and the, the full release is coming at the end of the year. Uh, Warcraft announced a Warcraft Direct show for the 30th anniversary, so we'll get more information whenever that is. Uh, the first Berker Kazan had a new trailer. There's going to be a technical test on October 11th, and it'll be out in 2025. This game looks pretty good. It looks kind of like a Souls-like, very bloody, kind of gory. Looks pretty good. I, I, I think I'll definitely check that out. Floatopia is an Animal Crossing-esque game that's coming to most systems. Um... It, it it's exactly what you uh, exa it's exactly what you think it is. It's a it's a game that looks like Animal Crossing. And then I'm trying to see if there was anything else. I think that was it for now. For now. Um, but uh, yeah. So I guess I missed a couple things from that article. Um, but there you go. Um, a boom, bada bing, bada bing, bada boom. <laughs> Uh, so all in all, I thought the Gamescom presentation was fine. I, I wasn't like jumping out of my seat going crazy, but, uh, you know, it, it was decent enough. I, I thought it was fine. Uh, then also Xbox also had a bit of a stream for it. I'm just going to quickly go through these because, oh, wow, we're already 47 minutes in. Oh my gosh. Uh, let me just go quickly through this. Indiana Jones had another trailer. It looked, it looks good. Metaphor refunds for refund T Tazio had a special interview with the developer and a new trailer for the game. It's coming out October 11th. Uh, the game looks good, but uh, I don't know why they're not just calling this a Persona game because it literally looks like a Persona game. Square with a Gun is getting a console release on October 15th. It's officially been confirmed. Square with a Gun is a sandbox game where you play as a squirrel with a gun, if you didn't know. Uh, Path of the X-File 2 got some gameplay. Uh, it looks fine. Wu Chang Fallen Feathers had a developer Q&A. Not much to say about it other than it's a Souls-like RPG set in the land of Shu during a dark and tumultuous Ming Dynasty. Kind of interesting concept. Commando's Origins was shown off a, shown off a gameplay. Um, it's a World War II commando force. Um, seems fine. Avowed had a gameplay walkthrough. This is officially coming out on February 11th. It's also coming to Game Pass. The big controversial thing from this was that they said that the game is going to be in 30 FPS because single-player games don't need to be 60 FPS, which I disagree about. I feel like if there's any games that should be 60 FPS, it's single-player games uh, because you don't have to deal with multiple hardware. You don't have to deal with people trying to play a game at the same time as another person. You don't have to worry about you know the... the uh, the intricacies of like, you know, getting people connected through this through through similar settings. I I I I, I just feel like yeah, you know, that's, it's great that you're focusing on other things, but come on, give us that 60 FPS because I think this game really needs it. Uh, it's one of those. It's an action. Pay, it's an action game. It's it's very fast paced. Uh, I, I I don't see why this shouldn't be in 60 FPS. And if it's the S, if it's the Xbox Series S holding holding it back. Then just drop the Series S, which I know might be kind of controversial to say because there's a lot of people who have Series S's. Me, myself, have one. But if that's what's holding you back from creating a truly next-gen experience, then just drop it for now and release it at a later date for the S. Is it? I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, they also had an Aura History Untold interview and gameplay walkthrough. It looks pretty good. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It looks pretty good. Is it going to be better than Civilization Seven? I guess we'll find out on September 24th. And then finally, at the end of the showcase, was a bit of a surprise for me personally because I've been looking forward to this one uh, very much. Uh, they showed off the next um, uh, ba -ba 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 Tales of Fury. Uh, I'm sorry, Tales of Iron game. Tales of Iron 2. It's officially coming to PlayStation, Xbox, etc. next year in February 20, uh, 2025. So I'm very excited, but I'm going to have to wait a little while for that one, I guess. Very excited for it, though. I, I'm, I'm hoping that it's going to be a good one, um, but it looks good. So, you know, that, what, what more can you ask for? But I uh, have to wait a little bit for that one. All right, let's go ahead and move on to what have I picked up this past week. All right, we're going to start off with a game that I've had for a little bit. I actually got this game 
kind of right before I started doing the pickup stuff. So I, I did say that, you know, on weeks that I have a little bit less or maybe nothing at all, I'm going to start going through some of my older, older things. And uh, we have Sonic Heroes there. I have There's a sticker over Knuckles, which is unfortunate, kind of like Mike Wazowski from Monsters, Inc. Uh, I picked this, this one up because, uh, obviously, uh, it's a classic game in the Sonic series. But it was also complete in box, which you know I love to see, and it was pretty cheap, only about twenty-five dollars. Um, very, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in in, 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 in finally playing this one. Seems pretty good. I got two games on sale from a website that that, that uh, uh, what was it called, like V something? I don't, I don't remember exactly what it's called. But uh, there were two games that I've been waiting to get for quite some time. Because the first game, Man of Medan, I didn't really like, 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 but I was, you know, I was like, okay, whatever. Um, but uh, these two games were only $10 a piece, and I, I've been waiting to pick these up. So we have uh, The Devil in Me, which also is a free PS5 upgrade. So even though I have the PS4 version, it's a free PS5 upgrade. So that's new in box. And then I also got The House of Ashes, which is the other game in the series, which I believe is set in like Afghanistan or something like that. This is also new in box, and this one's the PS5 version. It was the same price as the PS4, so I just decided to get the PS5 version. So I will be playing. I'll probably be playing at least one of those for Halloween this year. And then also, I talked about this uh, this Buzz series last week, but I did get Buzz Quiz World, which is the last of the Buzz series. Unfortunately, this one was also complete in box and was only like five bucks. And you know why? It's because you have to have these buzzer controllers to play the game. And you might be asking me, Yami, yeah, you don't do you have any of those? And I will tell you this right now. Uh, I I got a in, an incredible deal for you folks. Let me get this. I got the original Buzz Quiz TV game on the PS3 with four buzz controllers. If you're wondering how much I got this for, I believe it was like fourteen dollars. Fourteen dollars. This usually sells for like thirty, and I got it for fourteen dollars. It's in great condition. The outer box is a bit rough, but the inner box is pretty good. All the controllers seem to work pretty well as well. Uh, so, oh boy, I don't want to drop anything. Hold on. <laughs> so we got the uh, we got the game itself, Buzz Quiz TV. Complete inbox. Looks pretty good. And then we also got four controllers with the wireless dongle as well. So essentially what you do is you 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 buzz in and then you pick your answer. And whoever obviously whoever does it fast wins. And these do take, I think, double A batteries. Yeah, double A batteries. Looks like I'll need the yeah, it looks like I'll need to clean in there. It looks like someone left the batteries in them for a little bit too long before they took them out, but uh, that should be no issue. Um, but uh, I was looking for, I was looking for, I, I, I was looking for just controllers for quite a while, and then I saw this uh, bit, you know, this auction for this entire set, and I was like, no one's bidding on this. Obviously, this is a very niche thing to want, but no one was bidding on it. It was a brand new seller. I literally stole this from them. I'm, I'm not even kidding. Like, I literally stole this from them for $14.50 or whatever, plus ta uh, f plus shipping. So it turned out to be like $25 in total. This is a great steal. And I don't know how I do it sometimes. I'm just a little bit lucky, I guess. All right, let's go ahead and move on to what have I been playing this past week. First up is Black Myth Wukong. Uh, this is the Souls-like game coming from that Chinese studio that uh, everyone has been raving about. And I was going to wait on it, but I was I was tempted into getting it because the game looked so amazing, and I was. I was on Steam, and I was I was like, oh, the game's out. But I don't want to get it right now because it, you know, I, I, there's a lot of games coming, and I, maybe I'll get it on like a sale. But then I was watching some gameplay of, of a guy fighting, uh, you know, just some bosses, and I was, or a boss, not bosses, but a boss, and I was like, this looks so cool, it looks so well done. I can't skip this one, so I did end up getting Black Myth Wukong, and might I say that this might be 
one of the best Souls-like experiences that you can ask for. Um, it's not super difficult, at least not right off the bat. It seems to gradually get more difficult as the game goes on. There is a fair amount of exploration in the game, but also there's a there there are like there's like a boss rush like to the game as well. I the game is the game is simply beautiful to look at. You know, like this this is one of those games where you're playing it and you're like I can't believe this is a fucking video game. I mean, when I started gaming, it was the N64 it was polygons. It was, this is the best graphics. You can't get any better than this, right? And then the GameCube came out, and the PlayStation 2, and the Xbox 360, and the PlayStation 3, and games started looking better and better. And now here we are with Black Myth Wukong, which is probably one of the best-looking games to come out this year next to, like, Final Fantasy and Dragon's Dogma. Like, this is one of those games that they've been working on for quite some time. You can definitely tell that there's a lot of passion and, and artistry put into it because gee dang god damn does this look it just it looks so good and it also plays really well as well uh so if you don't know black myth wukong it's a story of the monkey guy the monkey king um and essentially uh he uh the monkey king gets uh gets gets cast down gets struck gets striked down by the other um mythological gods uh, uh from from China, from China, Chinese lore, and um, you are, I, I, they're kind of leaning towards like, oh, you're kind of like either the protege or the, you know, the re reincarnation of this monkey king, monkey god. Um, so you start off and you're obviously very weak. Well, maybe not very weak, but you're just kind of like, you know, you're just kind of like, you know, loosey goosey. You're kind of like a young, a young, a young chimp. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you just kind of start building your character from there and, and starting to take on like wilder and wilder wilder creatures um, so right now I'm a I'm pretty f I'm I would say I'm pretty far in the game I'm not like halfway through or anything like that but I'm definitely towards the end of like the first section I would say it's hard to really tell you exactly how far along I am because you go into an area and you beat like a couple enemies and you know you go through like the you, you, you search around this area and then boom they they hit you with a with a with a boss whether it be a mini boss or a full fledged boss the distinction is very weird in this game because there is a wandering boss that you can fight in one of the first areas who's very tough and you feel like oh I shouldn't be fighting this guy yet this is the guy they come back and fight but no, the other guy who you you can fight is is the side boss because the main path is past the guy who's very who's kind of tough, right? So it's it's a very weird distinction. Like, was the guy that I fought who had like a cinematic opening, but his but it was literally a, a dead end after you fought fought him a main boss, or is this random wandering guy who doesn't get an introduction a main boss, or was it a side boss? It's hard to say. Uh, I don't really know. There's so many of these bosses that you encounter. That's like, is this a main boss? There's an opening cinematic for him. It's very epic, but he goes down quickly. Or you know, it's not like uh. It's, there's there's just nothing to do after you fight the boss. You go around in a, to a different area. It's just it's 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 kind of weird in that way where it's like I don't know if I'm actually fighting bosses or if these are just strong enemies or these are side bosses or these are mini bosses. I don't know. There's there's really no distinction because so many enemies in the game, uh, not just like regular enemies, but so many enemies with like a health bar at the bottom and they got all this dialogue and they and they have all these moves. They get this these crazy cinematics and they're doing their whole thing and it looks it's it's awesome obviously and then you fight them and you're like okay i beat him wow that was a great fight where is why is there nothing here <laughs> and then you go around to a different area and like now here's the here's the boss that you want to fight right and it also there's other times where it's like a boss rush where you fight a boss then you go to the next area and it's you know it's like a winding path and then you get to the and the next area and there's a boss there and he's more difficult than the last guy and you're like okay and then uh, I did like a side boss too so this boss rush was like four four bosses deep so you know I do the third boss and then I get a side boss and he's like really he he's kind of difficult too and I'm like wow okay that was kind of cool and you go back and now you're get back on the main path and boom they they hit you with another side boss after fighting a few not a side boss like a main boss after the after fighting a few of the side care you know the side enemies and going through a side passage so it's a very interesting structure for a video game uh, especially like a souls game it's definitely not like 
anything that I've played before in the Souls-like genre. And obviously, it just kind of wears that Souls-like monk here, no pun intended, um, because it is, you know, like, okay, you die, all the, you know, you, the, you rest and all the enemies respawn. It's a bit hardcore at times. You know, it's a bit unfair at times with the enemy placements and stuff like that. Like, you know, it has all those things that you see in a Souls-like with skill trees and and stuff like that. But it also doesn't feel like a Souls-like at all. Like, the combat itself is completely different from anything that you may have encountered in the Souls-like genre. The closest thing that you can get to it is Sekiro. But even then, Sekiro had the whole deflection system and it definitely had the, the you know, it was, it was a From Software game. So it definitely had those Souls-like elements that you come to expect in the game. This one is very loosey-goosey. It gives you so many offensive capabilities to use that you feel like you're overpowered when you really, you're really not overpowered. It's just that you're using these things that they're giving you. And I can hear it already. In, in my mind, there is a guy in the back of my mind saying, Oh, you use the spells? That's cheating in this game. You don't actually you're not actually beating Black Myth Wukan if you use the the immobility spell on the bosses. I can just hear that argument in the back of my head from a niche group of people. And it's like, no, no, no. They're giving you all the tools to succeed in the game. Use those fucking tools. I'm not gonna bang my head against the boss for you know for ten hours straight because I refuse to use the magic spells that they give you in the game. No, one, the magic spells are fucking cool. Okay, they are so cool. the 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 immobilization spell is so worth it to use, especially when the enemy is about to do like a big giant move. You point at him and and you give him the the middle finger <laughs> and uh, he freezes and you can get some extra damage in there or you can use it as a time to heal without the pressure of having to dodge something right after it's it's a it's an incredible feature in the game uh, there's obviously more spells you can get along the way but as of right now i have the immobilization spell and i have a spell that allows you to transform into a past boss that you may have defeated so one of the first bosses that you go against is a like fox man who has a double-sided like spear and it's got fire on both ends, and he can light you on fire. Well, now you can transform into that boss and actually use some of his moveset to light the enemy on fire or just get a bunch of damage off before he expires, which is really cool. There's also another boss that you can use uh, in the same way as well, who has like this giant fan, and he's like whirling, he's like making like winds and stuff that can damage enemies, and he's also pretty good, but I've been using the Firefox, as most people have. Um, you also, like, there's a lot of different systems going on, so it is a bit crazy, but there's also a system of, like, the side bosses that you fight in the open world, they can leave behind, like, remembrances that you can use, so if you press RT and LT at the same time, you actually transform into that boss, and you do a single move, instead of being the boss for a little while, you do a single move, like the big head smash from, like, the first side boss, and, uh, you know, that does a lot of damage, obviously, a lot of poise damage as well. And all of that, it, it, you also have a whole nother system uh, for your healing items. Uh, you have the regular healing jug, which is obviously going to heal you, but then you also have like medicines and, and herbs and stuff that you can use to do constant healing or poison resistance and stuff like that. On top of all of that, the move set of your character is also very deep, and the skill tree has a lot of things that are very interesting that you don't normally see in a Souls like game. Uh, there's three different uh, stances that you can use, and you can actually switch between them during combat if you so desire. Right now, I'm just using the strong stance, as I'm sure most people are. Uh, if you hold down the heavy attack button, which is Y or triangle, um, you do like a big hit and, uh, to do the big hit, you need to fill up a meter with, by holding down Y, you need to fill up a meter and then you get a little, a little glowing white ball next to the meter. And that tells you that your move is ready. If you dodge during this charge up, or if you get hit during the charge up, it resets the meter. Um, so first off, you have one little ball you can fig you can fill. As you progress your character, then you have two balls, and then finally three balls, which does a more damaging attack, and the move changes. There's another stance that is like the high stance, and essentially what you do is you hold down Y or triangle to elevate your character up on his staff, and it, it, it goes boom, boom, boom. There's three tiers to it, 
and uh, it actually gets you away from the enemy one and two you do like a big attack if you if you get it get it filled up the, all the way so it's very cool the normal move set is also pretty cool as well there's a lot of different combo kind of things you can do so you, you you press x to do light attacks you can mix in some heavy attacks in there obviously the dodging is very loosey-goosey it does kind of remind me of secure in that way except it's even more loose than that uh, because you're using a monkey so he's jumping all around if you do a perfect dodge um, it slows down time a little bit, allows you to maybe get a hit in. Um, it also allows you to kind of keep track of the enemy a little bit easier, especially if they're a faster enemy. Um, also, perfect dodging will fill up that meter as well that I was talking about that you hold down Y for. Getting hits on enemies also fills up the meter a little bit as well. Uh, so there's several ways to do that, of course, which is very nice. I really like that a lot. And other than that, you can jump in the game. It's not been really useful so far, but you can jump in the game. <laughs> uh, there's like, there's not really like a parry system, I guess, but uh, there is like a move that you can do by holding down LT or L2, uh, where you can kind of like spin the staff around you and it blocks uh, projectiles as long as you have stamina, which is kind of cool, uh, very interesting. Uh, and all these things can be improved and upgraded. So uh, Black Myth Wukong has been really cool. It's been, in my opinion, and I'm sure that there's other people, you know, obviously everyone's experience is a bit different. So if I'm, so if I'm, what I'm about to say, if that makes you angry to hear, I'm sorry. It's just, it's my experience with the game. It's been a bit easy so far. And it's probably because I'm not past that first big, like, section of the game. Um, but I have been beating most bosses in two to three tries. One try to kind of get the feel for the boss, usually I'll die because, you know, I don't know a move or something crazy happens. And then two or, you know, two or three after that to just kind of, you know, get down the move set and then beat them. So it's, it's not been incredibly difficult so far. And I think it's because I've been utilizing everything at my disposal. I'm sure the game will start to pick up the difficulty after this section that I'm in right now, but this forest section seems to be kind of the beginner area or, or maybe the easy area of the game. Um, if it's not, I'm sorry if you're having trouble with the game, getting through it. I just, I, I'm just, maybe I'm just clicking with it more than other people. Um, but I, I do feel like the, this, this first area, this first whole adventure for part of the game has been a bit easy for me at least. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I guess if you're struggling with the game, you know, just maybe look at your different skills. Maybe you don't have a skill unlock that you kind of would need. And it doesn't take too long to unlock the different, you know, unlock a skill point. They're called sparks to the game, I'm pretty sure. But to unlock another spark, you, you just, you just you know, kill regular enemies or even bosses, obviously. Uh, but there are sections where you kind of go back and go through and, and kick the ass of all the care, all the enemies there and then, you know, get a spark point and spend it on something. Um so maybe just go in there and look and see, like, oh, I don't have a spark put on extra stamina or extra health, or you know, maybe I should activate this new move that I can do that would that would be uh, better for my character. You know, there's so many different ways to kind of improve your character and stuff like that. I feel like um, if you're struggling with the game, just kind of maybe maybe look at your skills first off. Um, two. Uh, get good. No, I'm I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm not that kind of guy. Two. Um, definitely get down your dodging is is another thing that i would say because enemies will most bosses and enemies will give you an opening to either do a charge attack or a combo so be very mindful of when to dodge attacks i think that'll really help you out a lot all these i mean every boss in any souls like is going to have a move set that you can learn so getting down the different moves that they have when you can dodge and when it's okay to attack is big, especially in a game like this where your character really doesn't have a lot of health. Um, you, can, you, can only, you can take about three or four hits before you either need to heal or you're dead. <laughs> so if you're struggling, that would be my main thing there is learn your, your dodging. Um, that'll very much help. If you get the perfect dodges down, then you won't have to hold down the, uh, the, the heavy attack as long to do a heavy attack. The other thing, too, is utilize that immo immobilization spell. You get that very early on. Uh, it, it works wonders. It really does. Don't forget about that. It recharges pr fairly quickly. I can usually use it maybe three times per mat, per, per boss fight. More if there's multiple phases. So definitely use that. If you're early on and you only have that spell, definitely abuse the shit out of that. The other thing that I would like to say is be mindful of the enemy's poise. 
a lot of times you can start doing a combo on an enemy and they start doing an animation for an attack. If you just hit the X button one more time to finish off that combo, sometimes it will stagger them. Obviously, it's a bit risky, but if you get that stagger in, then you can do the heavy attack and they're staggered again. Pretty cool. So if you can't tell, I am very much in love with Black Myth Wukong right now. The other funny thing about this game was when it launched, there was a list of things that you couldn't put, like talk about if you were a content creator. Like you couldn't mention COVID-19. You couldn't mention Winnie the Pooh or something like that. You couldn't mention blah, 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 blah. Um, obviously, that's a part of like government censorship in, in China. Um, luckily, I'm not streaming the game, so I don't have to worry about those things. And even if I was streaming, I would probably be one of those cheeky bastards who was like, oh. It's Winnie the Pooh time, baby. You know, I would probably, I would probably do stuff like that because it's, it's quite ridiculous the, the standards that are in China. Um, uh, so if I if I'm banned from using the internet in China, if I'm banned from China, I don't really care. I'm not gonna be going there anytime soon. Um, but uh, it it would be it would be kind of funny to see like if you're looking through a banned list. It would be kind of funny after this podcast comes out to see, like, give me the fair band for podcast talking about Black Myth Wukong mentioned COVID-19 and and Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> would be kind of funny to see. Um, but, uh, yeah, whatever. So that's, that's Black Myth Wukong. I'm very excited to continue playing it. And, um, yeah, check it out if you want to. All right, I've also been playing, obviously, more SteamWorld Heist 2. Um, I've, I'm pretty far in the game now, so I can now actually submerge the submersible. <laughs> um, and I was very surprised at how much more difficult the game is in the second area of, of the, of the game. Um, so that first area is, is pretty light in terms of like difficulty and stuff like that. You can, you can kind of usually beat most levels in one go without losing any of your allies or, or not getting all the loot, all the swag. Uh, but the second, the second area, like the main area of the game, really cranks it up a notch. Like it, it's like a full like two steps above, in terms of difficulty, which was shocking. I was I was shocked at how difficult some of those levels are starting to get. So I have taken a little bit of a break because I was I was starting to sweat, get a little bit frustrated with it. So I wanted to take a little bit of a break. Obviously, Black Myth Wukong came out, so I decided to spent some time playing that over the week as well. Um, but uh, I'm happy to say that, you know, SteamWorld Heist 2 is starting to... I mean, it was already really good, but having more difficulty in the levels is obviously something that I do like to see in games like this where you're building your characters and you are using your tactics to get around things like... And I, I, I just I, I like to see that steady increase in difficulty. This was more of like a shocking increase of difficulty, which maybe is a bit of a negative, but it's also like, yeah, you know, it, it, it's fine. Um, I'm sure once I start to get better weapons in this area, it'll become a little bit easier. Um, the character designs have been awesome in the game. Like I just got this um, crow type character who um, has like one of those old like uh, – those old masks, um, what, do you, what do they call it? The Plague Doctor masks. And uh, that was a, she's a pretty cool character. I put a, gave her a shotgun to give her that, uh, that, um, the, the, uh, what's it called? I haven't played in a couple days, so I'm kind of blanking on the name of the class right now, but it's a class where you can kind of like wheel and deal, I think it's called, where you, you can, you get bonus damage from being behind an enemy and you can move farther. Um, so, very cool. Very much still enjoying SteamWorld Heist 2. Check out Steam Powered Giraffe's new album, Not Sponsored. Uh, it's very good. I, I've been really enjoying the songs from that album. They just released a new uh, a new music video as well for um, the one of the songs in the album. So it's very fun. I'm very much enjoying my time with it. I will get back to it probably this week. Um, I just need to take a little bit of a break from it because it, it is getting a bit like it's getting a little bit hard, I will say. Um, but I'm sure that, like I said, once I get the better weapons and uh, I get I get my characters leveled up a little bit more, I think we'll be okay. But, um, yeah, as of right now, pretty good. And you might be wondering, oh, you're already in that big, the next the next big area. You must have skipped a lot of stuff, huh? No, Callus. I did every mission three stars, except for one. I, I did not go back and get the full stars on it because it was it was an annoying one. But uh, I did every mission before leaving the area and going to the next one, okay? 
So don't poo pee poo me saying uh, you're not exploring the map. I explored the entire map, got all the stars, got all the swag that I could, uh, except for maybe I think one I did not go back and redo. Uh, one of my characters died during it, and I, just, and I decided just to be say fuck it and leave because the the level was long and 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 kind of difficult for the first area. Um, but I did explore it fully, and I got all my stars uh, except for maybe one or two. Um, and I moved on to the next area and you are kind of locked out of going back right now. I think either that or I just haven't tried. I probably just haven't tried, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, um, it's been very good so far. I'm just being facetious, callous. I'm, I, <laughs> he gave me a, uh, just as a callous is one of my friends. He, he gave me a bit of grief for how fast I finished Elden Ring. And he's like, well, you must not have explored as, as, as well as I did. And I, and I, I opened my map and I'm like, I literally explored like 90 to 95 percent of this map <laughs> i missed i missed like two bosses <laughs> like come on, like come on just just because i'm good at the game doesn't mean that i'm not exploring fully okay all right games that we've finished today uh or finished this week on stream uh we finished secret agent clank it was a bad experience secret agent clank i did not like the game at all it was at least well, was it even playable? I guess it was playable, but it played pretty poorly. There wasn't a lot of fun being had in the game like other Ratchet and Clank games. Obviously, this is a spin-off, so you don't even have to play it if you're going through the games and, you know, in the story-wise, you don't it actually does have it doesn't have any real um, implications for the story, so you can you can pretty much just skip it. Um, I would say if you're going through the entire series, yeah, play it because you know, it is it is a it is a one in a million. You know, it's a it's a it's a bad Ratchet and Clank game. You don't get those too often, like bad. You know, um, but uh, yeah, it just it it didn't. I like there was some things that I enjoyed about it. Like there's like some stealth sections in there that I thought worked pretty well. Um, there was like two levels with one with Ratchet that I thought was pretty fun, where you blast off people's uh, towels <laughs> in like a bathroom with with a in, in like the prison bathroom because for whatever reason, Ratchet's in prison. And then uh, the other level that I thought was actually pretty fun, there's a Quark level where you do, like, an opera, and, like, Quark is singing, and there's, like, enemies coming out, and it's, like, an opera setting, like, a stage setting. I thought that was pretty fun. Uh, There was also another Quark level that I thought was good, too. Uh, I forget what it was, though. Uh, You went across, like, Tentacle Monster, and you were you were killing aliens and 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 chopping down tentacles and stuff like that. I thought that was pretty pretty cool, but... uh, other than that, the the rest of the game is is not is not good. <laughs> it's not good. Um, I also played and finished Cat Quest. This has been on my list for quite some time. I got the game for free on Epic Store a while ago, and I do have the second game as well. Uh, but I got these games a while ago. I've been meaning to play them. Uh, the first game is is decent enough. Uh, I thought it was I thought it was good. Um, I think the problem with Cat Quest, at least one is there's not a lot of variety in the game. Once you see every enemy, which is like, I don't know, six or seven enemies, you've seen them all. There's just there's there's just a few variations mixed in there, like, oh, this dragon's blue and he does ice damage. This dragon's red and he has fire. This dragon's purple and he does energy. <laughs> I don't know what to call it. Energy, magic. Um, there's also the big dragons who are also pretty much the same, except they do one different move. Like, instead of doing the ice move, he does the fire move, or he does the uh, energy move. It's pretty, but, but it's kind of the same as the other ones. There are some cute things in there, like uh, there's, a, there's a level 999 a uh, dungeon where you where there's just like one like of the of the easiest enemies in the game, but he's like super powered, which is, was a, was a really fun fight. Um, there's other cute things in there, like you know, there's some fun story missions to do. Um, there's a lot of cat puns in there. If you like cat puns or if you love cats, this is definitely a game that you would like to pl- that you would want to play. It's very ooh woo, aren't we so cute? Cats, 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 kind of going on. A lot of the you know a lot of the things you read is like that was possum or or uh, like uh, there'll be one that's like um, I. I can't believe this right meow, you know, <laughs> or I can't believe this meow. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of that in there, which does get a bit grading. I will say it definitely got a bit grading for me. Um, but uh, in, 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 in totality, I thought cat quest one was fun. Um, I had a good time with it. Uh, it. It's just a bit repetitive. 
the exploration is also a bit bare bones. The combat's a bit bare bones at the end of the day. Um, and the story also just kind of ends. <laughs> There's no like final credits scene. Uh, it just kind of ends and you then you're like, okay, go do whatever else you want. Um, and then there's a bit of a grind in there as well. But I mean, I was talking about this during playing and I'm like, well, in a game like this, as long as you're good at your dodging, like you anticipating enemy attacks and dodging, you can take down a level 200, uh, 200 enemy without, you know, it's, it's going to take a while, but you can, you can it, it, on paper, you can get it done. So, you know, as soon as they opened up the entire map for me, I was kind of doing like the more hard, the harder missions to get more XP and, and fight harder enemies and sure, I died a couple times, but I definitely got a boost of XP that I needed to finish the game in only two streams. So, all in all, would I go back to it? Probably not, but it was fun for what it's worth, and it, I got it for free, so I can't really complain. And finally, for the games that we played this past week on stream, Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary Edition. Uh, this has been on my list to play for a while as well. Ever since I got the Master Chief Collection, I've played the original game so, so many times. This is my first time playing the Anniversary Edition of the game. And as soon as I saw the new graphics style, I switched back to the original graphics. You can do that by pressing tab on your keyboard. It's pretty nifty. Um, so essentially, you can kind of switch willy-nilly whenever you want to, unless it's during a cutscene. So I had all the cutscenes at the original graphics. I, had, I pretty much played every level in the original graphics, except for one. Later on in the game, you go to a crashed or, or a, um, a, uh, a damaged um, Covenant ship, and it just doesn't look great nowadays. Um, if you turn on the new graphics though, you can actually see like above you, there's a, you know, the ship is damaged and it's dripping, you know, hydraulic fluid and all that. If you put it on the original graphics, it's really hard to tell what's going on in the level other than you're going through like a, uh, like a Canyon essentially. But uh, if you look up, it just looks like stars essentially. But if you turn on the new graphics, you can actually see that there's a ship above you. That's the only time that the new graphics actually were worth it. Every other time with the remastered graphics or whatever you want to call them, it just made the game so clustered. The the new graphics, they added all these lights and all these different like things to the panels on the walls and they're super detailed and like the in in the rock surfaces and, and stuff like that. And and when you and when you change to the new graphics, like these dark areas, now they're bright. You don't even need a flashlight to go through them anymore because they're so bright. They got they got lights everywhere. There's there's areas later in the game that's like you're playing through in the original game, you're playing through it at night and you can't really see too much. It's all like darkness around you except for the ice walls. And if you put on the new graphics, it's like daylight. There's icicles everywhere, and there's there's ice, and it's like, oh, wow, it looks beautiful. But it takes away the original games, the original atmosphere of the game, where after the flood come in, it's like very dark and very spooky, right? They kind of take that away if you turn on the new graphics. It just makes everything so bright, especially the library mission, where you're going through like all this industrial stuff, and it looks really cool in the original game. But with the new graphics, it's just it's just light overload. There's just lights everywhere. It's like it's blinding you, and um, like the walls have so much detail and so many layers. And it's just like wow. If you go back to the original game, it's just like a like that wall looks like uh, looks like my curtain right here. It's just like a black wall or a gray wall with like maybe some some like shading on it. If you if you if and and when you turn on the new graphics, it's like. Boom! That's not a wall. That's the Ferret 64 logo. <laughs> it, it's kind of it's kind of like night and day almost. It, it's a bit distracting. So for the most part, I had the original uh, graphics on, and that's really all I cared about. Because uh, the game itself still fantastic, still still a classic. Um, in the end, I gave it like an A tier, four out of five. Um, but uh, that original game, it's it's so it's it's so nice to play. The combat's great. The story is is decent. I, I really enjoyed the story. Uh, there's some people who complain about the looping nature of the story, where it's like you start on the Pillar of Autumn and you end on the Pillar of Autumn, and in between you also go back through some of those levels as well, like the snow area and the other area. I don't I don't mind that at all. I think that it's actually a pretty neat storytelling system to to loop back around like okay you were in the pillow of autumn you crash down to the to the ring and you go through all this stuff and then you kind of go through the stuff backwards in terms of like okay well now you're going back through this area and there's flood there instead of covenant or there's you know more going on in this area that you're going back through or the similar environment that you're going back through and then you end up on the pillar of autumn again and you do that really crazy cool ending sequence where you're driving the warthog through uh the blowing up uh you know infrastructure there i always love that section when i was a kid um, this is this might be a bit cringe to say nowadays, but uh, you know when I was a kid, I would blast "How You Remind Me" by Nickelback while 
playing that last level. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. I recorded a video of of like my monitor and doing that. I I thought it was the I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Obviously nowadays I I'm not like really in, I'm not into Nickelback anymore. But when I was you know when I was like 12 years old I I was blasting How You Remind Me through that whole section and. I was like making my own like music video playing the game as well. I, I thought I mean that's kind of that 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 would kind of be like my first video that I ever like edited and made. Obviously I, it's lost the, to time. I don't know where that is anymore, but uh you know, it's just one of those memories that I have and obviously there's a lot of nostalgia talking about this game, but I think that in general it is still like a nostalgia aside, it's still a great experience. It's a classic in its own right. It obviously paved the way for future um, first person shooters and stuff like that. So, uh, it is a, it is, it's a very important game in the landscape of the video game universe, but it's also still a really fun time, a really good time. Uh, I, you know, the AI is so advanced in the game. It's crazy how they, they can predict where you're going to go and they, uh, they, they dodge and run around and, and, uh, they they really put up a fight, especially towards the end of the game when you're fighting like the elite covenant and the flood. And they're very smart. It's, it's very, it's very impressive. Even, even to this day, um, and I just I have a lot of memories with the original Halo. The original Halo was the I, I joined the clan for multiplayer. It was the first clan I ever joined. Um, I think it was like AT or something like that. I, I joined a, uh, the AT clan with equal equal AT equal um, equal sign. Um, that was the first clan I joined. I joined with my one of my friends. Um, I remember playing so much multiplayer on that. Blood Gulch obviously was a big one. Uh, watching Red vs. Blue, obviously, because that you know, that was that was like the big thing on YouTube at the time. Um, you know, I, I obviously played the campaign so often. I I remember finding some like speedrunner things that I'm sure people knew about back then. But you know, there's there's a speedrun technique where uh, you ram like a wart on, on the. Uh, Oh, uh, what's the level called? It's the one where you like you like land on a beach and you're doing like the beach assault and you're trying to get to the control center of the of the Halo ring. Um, essentially, you can drive the Warthog to the the place you need to go that they lock the door at. So you can actually drive to that and ram your your Warthog into the door and the door won't close. And that's actually a speedrunning technique. I did that when I was a kid. I can't do it now, but I did that once when I was a kid and I thought that was the coolest thing ever. Um, and obviously I didn't know what speed running was back then or what, or what I had done at all, but I, I did know that I skipped an entire section of the game and I thought that was pretty cool. I thought, I thought that was a, I, I did, I, I did a pretty cool thing there. Um, and, uh, when I bought the game, even, even more nostalgia happening, uh, I bought it from a GameStop and obviously I was too young to buy an M rated game. So I brought my mom with me, but for some reason, my mom's like, I'm going to just stay in the car. Come get me if you need me. I knew where the game was. It was about five seconds. I walked in, grabbed the game, went up to the counter, and I'm like, I want to buy this game. And, of course, they were like, you have to get your parents. So I had to go back out to my car, get my mom, tell her why, come back in. They had to, go, of course, read the you know the back, blood and gore, violence, etc. And my mom had to okay it. And, uh, you know, I got the game, and I brought it home, and I installed it. And, yeah, I was, I, I was pretty much – it was pretty much love at first sight. Even farther back in my memory, I remember my uncle burned a copy of Halo Combat Evolved to a random disc for us to play. It didn't work, though. So unlike Revolt, which started my love for Revolt, was that a burned disc of Revolt. Uh, for, you know, for, for Halo, it was like I kind of remember glimpses of that game when I was like nine years old, uh, playing it on a computer for a little bit and it crashing all the time. But, um, you know, that, that that's back in the day. So... Yeah, lots of memories with this game. I wish I could give it a higher score, but I have to still grade it on my my you know mature grading scale that I use nowadays. And uh, it's still a really strong contender. It's a four out of five in my opinion, um, but it's it's still really good. It, it's 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 a classic, and I I, I love the game. I, I I love Halo Combat Evolved, um, uh, and uh, yeah, it's 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 one of those games that uh, defined my younger gaming career. You know, so there you go. All right, let's move on to what's in the news. Okay, uh, the Nintendo Museum had a Nintendo Museum Direct this past week, which I thought was pretty cool. They showed off a lot of the museum, but not everything that's in the museum. So, uh, obviously, work on the building is complete. The inside is also, I guess, pretty much complete. They're scheduled to open the Kyoto 
Nintendo Museum in October. So October 2nd, 2024. So inside the museum is obviously some historical stuff. Obviously, they have like all the different things they made when they were a toy company, the card games that they made. Uh, they have like a whole like area in the, in the museum that like the floor is one of the card games and you have like a you get like an iPad from the museum and you can go around and play the game on the floor, which is kind of cool, I guess. Um, they had, of course, the wall of games. So every Nintendo published game from the Famicom all the way up to the Switch uh, where it was in a display case. They also have NES stuff as well in there as, uh, too. And of course, because, you know, the Famicom was, was the, J the Japanese version of the NES, they had to make sure to give that distinction to the Japanese audience, like the Famicom. We had the Famicom, but we also have the American and Europe uh, version, which was called the NES. Uh, so Miyamoto obviously was presenting this all. This is obviously his baby, essentially. Like, he, he worked very hard on this, obviously. You can tell he was very passionate about it. And as the video went along, like they started giving, it started getting more and more crazy. Uh, so you know, he went into this area that had like a pitching machine that they used to create. It was a recreation of the old pitching machine that threw out little plastic balls, and he was hitting them. He was hitting the balls with a plastic uh, bat, of course, and he was actually aiming for things that were on like this old school looking like. Uh, 1970s style house or 1980s style house when it's, this would when the when the device would have been in those houses and you know he hits like a uh, a stack of bottles and Mario and Luigi start spinning around or he 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 hits a he hits a printer and also it prints out like a Nintendo 2024 uh museum like a uh, uh piece of paper and it sucks it back in and if you hit like a pikmin like the pikmin spin or or make a noise and it was very it was very cute very cool um, throughout the whole thing, they were showing like these giant controllers hanging from the ceiling. And I was like, wouldn't it be so cool to have like a giant controller hanging above me right here, like an N64 controller right above me. Um, and, uh, I was also like, Oh, what if you could play that? Like that's that, that looks almost playable. Well, what do you know? The next room he walks into, there's a giant Famicom controller with every Nintendo published, uh, game on there. And you can actually play this the Nintendo game with a giant Famicom controller. Two people at the controller, one with the A and B button, the other person with the D-pad. There was an N64 controller. There was an SNES controller, I think. There was also Wiimotes, like giant Wiimotes and nunchucks that you could use as well, which is also, like, super cool. Like, there was people in the background, I think they were playing, like, WarioWare Smooth Moves or something, but they were, like, moving the controller, and, like, four people were controlling it, and the N64 controller would take, like, at least four people to control it, I would say. Um... So the thing that they showed off, too, was uh, that there was, like, every time you come to the museum, you get, like, 30 coins to use, and uh, you can use them to play games and stuff like that, which is a good idea, making sure that, you know, if, if you want to do something, you go and do it, right? Uh, and you can't replay games, I guess, uh, after you do them um, until you come back the next time, which is, you know, kind of weird, but whatever. Um, the last thing they showed off was, like, this, uh, because they used to have, like, um, these, like, shooting gallery type things that they used to make. They had like this giant like 13, 14 player uh, area that used uh, super sh super scope bazookas and the NES blasters, and you actually shoot like the Koopa Troopas and Goombas as they popped up. Don't shoot Mario and Peach though, and you would get points and stuff like that. It just it looks so cool, and obviously there was more that they didn't sh they did that they didn't show off, which is crazy to me. Um, but uh, that was like it was such a really cool thing to see, and some I I, I mean. I don't think I'll ever make it to Japan in my lifetime, unfortunately. But if I was if I was to go to Japan, that would definitely be on my list to go to the Nintendo Museum. The other cool thing is is that it's actually built on top of the location that the original Nintendo Toy Company was. So there's a lot of history there too. Uh, the other thing that they announced uh, after the video was done is that if you get a, a ticket for the museum. It actually, you can actually create a me and put your me on the ticket, which I think is would be a really cute thing, like a really cute collector's thing to have. Uh, so essentially, you get like a, a a lanyard with your with your character, your me character on it, which is just so so cute. I think that's such a great idea. Obviously, Mii's were a big part of the Wii era, and they went they they did go into the Wii U and the Switch era, but they're not as prevalent now. Uh, but uh, there was a time when the me was king and. Uh, it's just it's a very big part of the of the history of Nintendo, and um, you know, it's just it's just one of those things that's like very very cool, very very imaginative, 
Uh, Miyamoto was so excited while talking about these things. He just he was just gl- he was glowing the entire time. I was I was I was almost moved to tears with how excited he was. Yeah. <laughs> um, and at the very end of it all, there was these four toads lined up, and they each made a different no- like a different um, chord or or sound, you know, vocal chord. And he hit them all in a row, and it's like that's just the beginning of what we have in store for you. So. Very cute, very cool. I I can't wait to see like tours of it and stuff like that. I think it would be really cool to to go actually. But um, yeah, uh, the only thing that I would like to mention is that the color palette is kind of just gray, uh, gray and white. I guess I feel like I mean, I'm sure there's there's like bits of red in there as well. Maybe they're still working on some of the more finer details of it, but. For the time being, like it just kind of looks a bit like warehousey, <laughs> I guess you could say sometimes. Um, so maybe if you're actually there, you can actually look and see what's going on, or maybe they're still like you know adding things to the museum. I'm sure they'll add things to the museum for the time, you know, for for now until the future, into the future. But um, and as of right now, no news on whether the Gulf War Game Boy is going to be displayed there. People are speculating that yes, it will be. Um, so, you know. That would be cool to see that there as well, I guess. Um, and uh, let me see here. Nintendo is now accepting entries for October and November tickets. The official website says the tickets will be sold via randomly selected drawing. So it's like a, it's it's a it's a it's like a it's like bingo. <laughs> They're randomly choosing your your number. The dead the entry deadline is August thirty first. So if you're gonna go to Japan in October or November, make sure you get on that queue now all right so um P- playstation stars members uh there's something there's something weird going on with playstation stars so starting october 24th you have to accept the new updated terms of service or you're going to be or your subscription is going to be canceled your, your account's going to be canceled uh, if you don't do that before then all your points and stuff will expire and you won't be able to use that if you do accept the new terms and services Points will expire after 13 months of them being in your account. So if you're waiting to build up to a game, um, I guess they want you to buy, buy, buy because there's no way you're going to get a new game for like 8,000 PlayStation Plus uh, PlayStation points in 13 months if you're just buying like the first party PlayStation games, you know? So uh, very weird. Uh, the new points will be effective October 24th, like I said. And then on March 1st of next year, eligible purchases will be updated to exclude subscription payments made in the PlayStation Store. So if you're renewing your PlayStation Plus subscription, it will not count towards your points anymore, which is just bizarre. Um, So, yeah, at at this point, if you don't accept the new terms and services, your account's going to be deleted. I logged into the PlayStation app the other day to try and accept the new terms and services. It didn't even pop up for me. So I don't know if my account's just going to be automatically deleted because it's just not showing up. I don't know. It's very strange. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's, it's so weird. Like this is such a weird thing. PlayStation stars is already like a very niche thing that not many people are probably using. Um, and to get to, to, to do something like this to it, that's going to be, be even more like of a, of like a, why am I even a part of this kind of thing? It's just, it's, it's beyond me. It's very strange. So, um, there you go. PlayStation points is getting weirder. (laughs) Uh, I said that I was going to talk a little bit about Concord later, and we're here. So Concord ha- was released on, like, Thursday this past week. And uh, right now on Steam, it's not performing very well. I don't think it's, it's performing very well on PlayStation 5 either. Now, there's a lot of people saying it's a, gr- it's, it's a, it's a fun hero shooter. And uh, if you if you want to check it out, make sure you do. Uh, me personally, when I played the the open beta for it, I didn't feel like it was really that unique per se. I mean, it was fun, obviously, with a friend and, and playing around with it. I, it was fun, and the graphics are fantastic. But this isn't one of those games that I'm going to go out and buy day one. I'm going to wait for a sale on this one. If they put it below twenty dollars, like nineteen ninety nine, you know, I'll 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 probably buy it then. Um, but as of right now, I'm not planning on buying it now. But I'll I'll, I'll buy it later, of course. I think that the idea for the game is sound having a ragtag group of characters that you can kind of swap out and and get new stories for as you go through the go through the different seasons of the game i think that's a good idea the problem is that i think the game should have been 
you know, uh, like a party swap out kind of game. Maybe make it an art, like maybe make it a, a, a turn based combat kind of game. You know, something like that, and make it something unique. But as of this point, like this is a, a this is eight years of work for this game, and I feel like it's it's just coming out to such a such a quiet reception. Only six hundred. The the peak count for concurrent players right now is at six hundred and ninety seven, which is less than Lord of the Rings Gollum. It's less than Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. It's less than Redfall's peak players. And uh, obviously, Black Myth Wukong is peaking at 2.4 million players, so they might have even chose a terrible time to put the game out because Black Myth Wukong is overshadowing it. So there's a bunch of different things going on that's really causing this game to get shafted really quickly. Now, I'm not, I mean, I'm not a person who just joins a hate train. Oh, hello, Randy. <laughs> Look who decided to join the show. Look who ran in here, and then as soon as I tried to grab him, he ran out of the room, scared for his life that I was going to pick him up and put him in front of the camera. Thank you, Randy. <laughs> what a goof. Uh, what was I saying? <laughs> Um, I'm not gonna join. I'm not a person who joins a hate train for a game. I give my honest and true, ex, you know, experience and opinions about it. And when I played it, it didn't. It it was just a generic, you know, six v six hero shooter. And I don't think it's gonna be anything more than that. But if you go into the game wanting that, you're gonna have a great time with it. I know there's a lot of people who are defending the game right now, saying it's actually fun. It's it's on the same level as other hero shooters, maybe even above other hero shooters. That's not gonna sell me on the game. Because I'm not really that big into hero shooters anyway. So I'm going to wait for, you know, wait for a sale. I'll pick it up when it's like 20 bucks. I'm sure it won't be too long. I do want to get it physically at least. So, you know, there's that. They're going to get a physical sale off of me. Um, but at this point, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that we need to add to the hate train, obviously. But I also don't think that a lot of the criticism is coming from nowhere. Coming from a place of hate. Because I feel like the game... When I played it, at least during the beta, it, it wasn't like it wasn't knocking my socks off. It was it just it, it was like okay, we have a bunch of different ideas from other games that we're just kind of jamming into these characters. Uh, have fun with it, and and even though I did have fun with it, Greedy Waffles and I played it together. We had fun. We had a couple of great games together. Um, it, but it's not a game that I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go spend forty dollars on that because it was so much fun. I'm gonna wait for a sale because I don't I I because at this point I don't know how long this game is going to last, which is sad to say because it's a first party Sony game. Lots of people, very passionate people, worked on it obviously, and they're gonna obviously defend their own game obviously. But you know that's the thing. A lot of people worked on this. It took eight years to develop, and um, it's just it's unfortunate that yeah you, know, you know there's 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 other options out there right now that that are free to play. That people are gonna are gonna be like, oh, I'd rather play Overwatch Two, or I'd rather play uh, the new uh, Marvel Rivals coming out because that's gonna be free to play, or or I'd rather play uh, what's other hero shooter like Valorant or something. You know that they're they're all free, and and I, I and Sony's putting a price tag on this one, obviously to recoup the losses from development. But um, I think that that's going to hurt it in the long run as well. So maybe eventually down the road, it'll be free on PlayStation Plus or it'll be just free in general to play. Uh, but as of right now, you got to spend $40 on it. And I just feel like ah, that's that's a bit much to ask for a brand new IP. It was marketed as like, oh, it's the Guardians of the Galaxy. No, wait, it's a it's a it's a it's a hero shooter. <laughs> you know, um, the, 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 the video game industry as a whole is swamped with hero shooters right now. It's swamped with live service games, even though this isn't technically a live service game. It is like an online only game, so it kind of goes under that category a little bit. Um, and it's one of those things. It's like it, it sucks because it was fun, but it wasn't fun enough that I was gonna go and grab the game right away or, or play the game right away. So, as of right now, the numbers for Concord are ex are, are very low for a first party PlayStation game. We don't know the numbers exactly on PlayStation. But I can tell you without any research that it probably didn't sell too well either. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that's not going to be like a crazy number of people playing. I, I'm guessing with the PlayStation player count, it's probably it's probably at like 1,500 people playing across both PlayStation and PC. But we, we can only see the Steam, the Steam numbers, you know, right now. We, don't, we won't really know exactly how many people played the PlayStation version until the sales numbers comes out, which could also be misleading as well, so... There you go. Um, so 
I will say good luck to Concord. I do wish it the best, but I will be waiting until a sale. So, you know, down the road, I'll eventually play it. Or play it again, I guess I should say. Anyway, moving on. Until Dawn, the price point for the Until Dawn remake, remaster, whatever you want to call it, has been announced. It's $60, which is is it's it's not shocking to me that they're putting it at sixty dollars. I personally would say fifty for this, but sixty sure. The other thing that's really weird is they also showed off the new um well the the box art for the game and it looks exactly the same as the PS4 version of it. The other thing that I think is really weird is that they do not have an upgrade plan. If you had the PS4 version, you cannot just get the ps5 version for like 10 bucks or something which i feel like is such a stab in the heart for this game uh there's a lot of people who already have until dawn whether it's through playstation plus or buying it on their own because obviously it's a very it was a very popular game it still is pretty popular um especially for trophy hunters so why they wouldn't have a 10 dollar upgrade path for this is a bit bizarre I understand you, 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 you redid the game, you gave it new lighting effects, you gave it new camera angles, you gave it 60 frames per second, you're locking it in at 1080p, and, you know, there's, you know it's, it's, gonna, it's, it's running on new hardware, the PS5 hardware, and there's no backwards compatibility, so you don't have to worry about a PS4 version of the game holding things back, and... But but that but that's the thing. The the base game is still going to be unchanged. Like sure, they rearranged where the totems are. Sure, they added some new cutscenes and maybe a couple new parts to the story that you can play through. But at the end of the day, I feel like a ten dollar upgrade path would be such a love letter to the people who already enjoyed the game and just want to play through it again because it's got better graphics, better lighting, etc. Why not just give us that option of like a ten dollar upgrade path? You did it in the past. There's plenty of games of the past that you can go up. Oh, there's a ten dollar upgrade. Back when the PS3 and the PS the, and, and the PS4 launched, there was ten dollar upgrade pass for like every single game. Assassin's Creed Black Flag, Call of Duty Ghosts. Um, yeah, <laughs> I can't. I, I'm not. Th- I'm, I can't think of any others off the top of my head right now. But I'm sure there's a couple you can probably think of there where it's like, okay, you can pay ten dollars and boom, you can put that PS3 disc right into your PS4 and you can play the game. Why not have this for Until Dawn? It just doesn't make any sense, especially because you're naming it the same thing. It's just Until Dawn again. It's not Until Dawn Remake. It's not Until Dawn Remastered. It's not Until Dawn uh, Unearthed. I don't know what else you can call it. It's just Until Dawn. So why not give it that upgrade path for the original PS4 to the PS5? It just doesn't make any sense. So $60 is going to be the price tag. I think it's a bit much for this. I'm definitely going to wait for a sale for this one, too. Um, I'll probably wait until it's like 20 bucks or so again. And then we'll probably be enjoy- you know, playing it next year for Halloween. You know, Not this year, but next year, because that'll probably be when it's on sale. It'll probably be go on sale or maybe even, maybe even hit PlayStation Plus between then and now. Or, or now and then. I don't know. But uh, that's just my opinion. All right, so there was a mod for... Um, what was it, Modern Warfare, the original Modern Warfare 2, or, or one of the Modern Warfare 2 games that was going to be giving you, uh, like, the original game, the original guns and putting them into the second game or something like that. Um, this is actually the first time that I've really heard of something like this happening where a cease and desist comes to, like, a Call of Duty modder. Because uh, Call of Duty mod, the modding community for Call of Duty has been around since the first game. I mean, the original Call of Duty on PC... There were zombie mods. There were modern. There were modern combat mods. There were, there were mods that added new weapons to the game and, and reconfigured settings and stuff. There was the modding community was community has been huge with Call of Duty since the beginning. Um, so it's weird that they are getting a cease and desist on the behalf of Activision related to this H2M mod project. Uh, they are complying and, and they are completely shutting down operations immediately for the mod uh, as of that uh, as of the tweet. Uh, even the Twitter says shut down in the bio um they also said that anyone putting out a gofundme or any sort of donation thing is not the official mod people they are not going to be doing a a gofundme or anything like that for it uh this is comes this actually comes shortly after they announced when the mod was going to be available they're going to be putting it out uh on the 16th of august so um 
I, I, I guess uh, Call of Duty just was like, okay, you did all that. Um, okay, well, now, fuck you. <laughs> so, yeah, I think this was for the original Modern Warfare 2. It was going to add in more lo- uh, more guns, going to add in some new maps. It was going to be a big mod package for the original. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, or maybe this was for the original Modern Warfare Remastered. I'm sorry, this is for the original Modern Warfare Remastered. Because I'm, I'm seeing a tweet here that they're like, hey, buy uh, Modern Warfare Remastered. It's 50% off, and you'll be able to play the Modern Warfare Remastered H2M mod. Um, so there you go. Uh, so it's unfortunate to see that this is being shut down, especially because they've obviously been working on it for quite some time. You know, I mean, this is this is obviously a big a big thing. Um, this is this is also a very unprecedented thing because I don't think we've seen a, a cease and desist for a mod for a Call of Duty game ever. I mean, it, it, I, 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 cannot, I cannot think of the last time that a mod for Call of Duty has been shut down, um, but maybe it's because they're adding in those Modern Warfare 2 weapons into Modern Warfare Remastered. Maybe that's why, is, is because they have um, Modern Warfare 3, the new one out there right now, that also has every weapon from that game, so maybe, maybe they're thinking that it's too closely related, they're going to lose sales to that. I don't know, but uh, as of this point, the H2M mod for Modern Warfare Remastered has been shut down with a cease and desist, and they are complying, so there you go. Apparently, the files for the H2M mod are available to download. Um, if they've been leaked or something like that. Um, I'm not sure if it was one of the people who actually worked on it or, or what, but uh, it is unofficial, so be wary if you're going to try and download that. Okay, uh, the X. Uh, Microsoft has revealed a new adaptive joystick for uh, people who need more accessibility to their gaming rigs, their gaming, uh, their gaming controllers. Uh, this joins a slew of other, uh, you know, Xbox-funded um, uh, uh, accessibility controllers for people with disabilities. Uh, so this one kind of reminds me of a uh, a, a Joy-Con, or a, not maybe not a Joy-Con, but more like a nunchuck for the Xbox. Uh, I'm sorry, for the Wii. Oh my God. For the Wii, uh, an uncheck for the Wii. Uh, so this is, this is called the adaptive joystick. Uh, it is essentially what exactly what you think it is. It looks like a nunchuck. It plugs in via USB C to USB. They you can remap the four buttons on the front, and there's also two shoulder buttons on the on the on the on the on the front of it. So on the top of it is the four buttons that you can remap, and on the front is the shoulder buttons you can use. And then there's one joystick in the middle. I don't believe it has any motion control capabilities or anything like that, but this would be for someone who, you know, maybe they're not able to use both of their their hands, or maybe uh, maybe um, you know they they can't they don't have a lot of motor function in, in in a hand, so they need to you know just use their thumb or something like that. So it's designed for people who have disabilities who need them. Uh, who need these kind of controllers. And like I said, this, this joins way, you know, there's plenty of offerings from Xbox officially for these kind of controllers. So it's really cool to see them continuing to do that. Uh, they are a bit pricey, in my opinion, especially for accessibility-wise. Like, you know, the Proteus controller that I talked about a while ago is like $300. You know, it's kind of crazy. But then they put out something like the 8-bit Duo controller, which is like which is like 60 And, and I'm sure that this controller is going to be like a $50 or whatever kind of, kind of thing. But... Uh, you know, cool. I, I I think this is a great idea for Xbox to invest in the you know gaming for disability, you know controllers for disability, people with disabilities. Um, I think it's great that they're that they're producing stuff for these these players because you know even though PlayStation does have their accessibility controller out there now, you know there's not a lot of PlayStation accessibility controllers. There's not a lot of Nintendo like first party play, you know accessibility controllers. So it's cool to see stuff like this come from official Microsoft products. And um, next up on the news, I was going to say finally, but we still have another thing. Uh, the Mario Kart series Lego sets are coming in 2025. So this is a kind of a cute thing. Uh, there's going to be multiple sets with multiple characters, uh, including Donkey Kong, Toad, Yoshi, Mario, Baby Mario, and Baby Luigi. And then there's also, like, uh, there's also Baby Peach, um, Toad on a motorcycle and uh, uh, Ludwig or whoever that is. So all these sets will be available next year for varying prices. Um, obviously, the bigger the set is, the more expensive it's going to be. So there's like a pit crew for Mario's Mario Kart. Uh, that's probably going to be like a $60 one. Yeah, right here I have the prices here. So that, that's going to be a $40 one, the Mario Kart Toad's Garage. And then the most expensive one is the Mario Kart Baby Peach and Grand Prix set, which is going to be $80. The Baby Mario and Baby Luigi set is going to be $30. The Donkey Kong, 
uh, and Donkey Kong J- Jumbo set uh, will be f- about $35. I'll probably buy this one. This one's kind of cute, cool. Uh, the Mario Kart Standard Edition is going to be $20, and then the Mario Kart Yoshi Bike Set is going to be $15, which is actually a pretty nice price point for that as well. Uh, so all those will be available sometime in 2025, so make sure you keep your eyes open for that. But uh, they're pretty cool. I like the Donkey Kong one the most, with the Yoshi one being kind of like you know second best, of course. And the rest of them are pretty cute as well, so check those out if you want, if you want on the uh, official LEGO new, uh, website. And then finally for today, we have um, unfortunate news that the original voice actor for the Japanese version of Bayonetta, the Japanese voice actor for Bayonetta, has unfortunately passed away at the age of 61. At Atsuko at Tanaka has been the voice of Bayonetta for all three of the Bayonetta games um, for the Japanese version of the games. She also voiced Chun-Li for the Street Fighter series, Laura Croft for uh, those games, for the Japanese version of those games, um, she also voiced uh, a character from Near Replicant named Kane, Trish from Devil May Cry, and Lisa Lisa from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Um, Platinum Games came out in a statement and said, We are incredibly saddened to hear about the passing of At- Atsuko Tanaka, who provided the Japanese voices for the titular character in the Bayonetta series. We are extremely grateful for her breathing life into the character of Bayonetta and offer our dear, deepest condolences to our loved ones at this difficult time. So, yeah, sad to hear of her passing. Obviously had a, a very wide casting net for uh, for her appearances in video games, but also she also did a lot of voice acting work for, I believe, TV shows as well. So um, if you've listened to a Japanese dub of a, of a game or of an anime or whatever, yeah, you might have heard her voice a couple times now. So uh, sad to hear of her passing and uh, my thoughts with her, with her family. Okay, let's move on to the final part of the show, which is what's coming soon. This is a long one today, folks. Thanks for sticking with me. Phantom Blade Zero had a combat presentation for the game. Uh, They kind of went through a single combat encounter, and then they also did like a boss fight. They said that this game was not a Souls-like, and it looks... Pretty much exactly like Sekiro, but obviously it's 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 a bit different. But it has like a parry system. It has uh, the the exhaustion meter for the for the enemies that you're fighting. You know, obviously uh, it has a big health bar for the for the bosses. Uh, they claim that's not a Souls like because it doesn't have respawning enemies. But to that, I say it's in the genre. It's still in the genre. You ha- you have a healing flask. You have really powerful enemies. You have a health bar at the top of the screen for bosses. You have an upgrade tree. You have a bonfire type thing. So it's kind of like a mix between like dark souls and maybe like an action adventure game, you know, but as of this point, I would say it's, it's very much like it's, it's, it's a souls like just because it doesn't have respawning enemies doesn't mean that it's not in the same uh, un- un- under the umbrella of a souls like, right? Um, but they showed off the gameplay. It, it looks it looks pretty good. I feel like there's not enough weight behind the movements sometimes with like the with the hits on enemies. I feel like they don't get phased as much as I would like to see them get phased or or whatever. Like especially with the weaker enemies. Um, but uh, the gameplay looks crisp. Looks good. The animations of the characters look stellar. Like mwah, Chef's Kiss. Like goodness gracious, the the animations for the characters are are really crazy. Um, but if you want to check it out, it's available on PlayStation's YouTube channel at this moment. Also, um, a game coming from the same people who who made Blasphemous called The Stone of Madness is a tactical stealth game coming to PlayStation 5 and Xbox and etc. Uh, so this is coming in 2025. The Stone of Madness is a real-time stealth strategy title set in 18th century Spain about a group of asylum inmates attempting to escape the asylum. Uh, the trailer itself was pretty pretty nice. Um, if you know what Blasphemous looked like, it was like a pixel art Souls-like adventure, 2D Souls-like adventure. This is completely different. This looks hand-drawn, um, you know, lots of different, sh- like, coloring shades and, and, and stuff like that. Characters who are kind of, like, cartoonish, I guess you could say, but it looks very much hand-drawn, almost like the new, like, Prince of Persia... Uh, uh, roguelike game that came out the rogue prince of persia it kind of has that same kind of 
art style. It's, you know, it's a bit cartoony, a bit whatever. Um, I'm not sure how it, exactly it works, but it seems like it's uh, obviously it's very stealth based. So they want you to get, you know sneak up behind an enemy, enemy and stab them or poison them or whatever. And essentially, uh, each day you start your day and you kind of you know continue farther and farther in your escape plan until you can finally escape. So I don't know if it's got roguelite elements to it. Maybe not. Maybe so. I don't know, but. I'm sure we'll see more of it before next year when it comes out, but I'm intrigued. Looks kind of cool. Lost in Random is getting a sequel called The Eternal Die. If you don't know what Lost in Random was, um, essentially it was like a third person, um, kind of like a random action game where you roll a dice and you get like these little cards. And if you have like a, if the dice has a three on it, you can use a card that requires three energy, or you could use like a two and a one energy at the same time. And you have things fight for you, and you obviously have some combat capabilities with like a slingshot, but it's mostly to gain more like magic for better cards and stuff like that. So it was a very unique game. It had like a Tim Burton style to it, with like uh, the characters being like kind of like claymation kind of esque, kind of. Um, you know, Nightmare Before Christmas looking kind of characters. So that was a cool thing about the game. Uh, this new game that they're coming out with is uh, essentially Lost in Random Hades Edition. Uh, it's, a, it's a roguelite action game with a top-down perspective. I think that this game loses a lot of that initial charm that you had with you know, the, 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 the way that the original game was and how it played. Um, but essentially you have multiple weapons to choose from. You still have some sort of like die mechanics to use, like you roll the die for something. Um, but it really does look more like, uh, you know, another, another Hades type game where it's top down. You have multiple weapons to choose from. You got boss fights to go through and it's a roguelite. So, you know, when you die, you come back and you have to go through it all again. Obviously it was, it was inspired by that kind of, that, that roguelite genre. Um, so it, it is a bit disappointing to me to see it change style so drastically. And, but, it, but it's more, but it's more disappointing that it's losing the charm of that original game just from like the the the, the gameplay they've shown and the screenshots that I'm looking at, it did lose a bit of that charm that the original game had, that that grittiness that it had, the atmosphere that it had. Just because now it's just this is just an action, an action roguelike game. Um, so it's a little bit disappointing there. Um, but the original game is still great. I put it on my top 15 games the game the year that came out. Probably would have put it into my top 10 if I redid that real, that list, but. Um, it was a fun time. I enjoyed it. I thought the story was good. I thought the combat was fun and unique, and obviously the, you know, the the animation style was very cool. So check out the original game if you want to. And uh, this new game is coming out in 2025. Sonic X Shadows Generations. They announced the collector's edition coming from Limited Run Games. It is very Dreamcast heavy. So if you're a fan of the Dreamcast and Sonic. This might be just the thing for you. Pre-orders are going to be open. They're actually open now until October 6th. If you want to purchase this, it'll be available for $250. What does it include? So you get either the uh, you know Xbox, Switch, PlayStation 4, or 5 version of the game with an authenticity uh, seal. You get a individually numbered certifi- certificate of, of authentic- authenticity. A commitment. A com- Oh my god. A com- commemorative Dreamcast jewel case that you can use for the game. Uh, there's also the official soundtrack on CD. You get three Chow figurines. You get an art book for artwork of the game. And uh, you also get a Sonic Shadow and Classic Sonic shoe keychain, along with a steelbook for Switch or for PlayStation and Xbox. The piece. La resistance, though. Let me take a swig of water. The the piece la resistance is the Sonic and Shadow Dreamcast statue. So it's Sonic doing a thumbs up, and it's Shadow doing a uh, an emo pose, and they're standing on top of a Dreamcast uh, console. Pretty cool, I will say. Like that's pretty badass for this collector's edition. Obviously, it's a bit pricey, but uh, if you're a fan of Sonic, if you're if you were a fan of the Dreamcast back in the day, and you played Sonic games on the Dreamcast, this might be something you might want to look into. Maybe setting aside some money and picking this up because I think that this is a this is a very cool collector's edition. A bit expensive, but looks very cool. Very very cool stuff in there. So check that out. That like I said, that'll be available 
to pre-order until October nine, uh, October six, and um, it'll ship sometime in, in July next year. But the uh, the game itself is going to be available at, like October six, I think, or something like that, or or whatever. Um, so that that'll ship out between October twenty fifth and the eighth of November if you get that from Limited Run Games. I believe the game does come out. I think October twenty fifth actually. I'm not sure. I don't remember. But uh, yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool indeed. Emio, The Smiling Man, Famicom Detective Club. This game is coming soon on, uh, on August 29th. And there's actually a demo available for the game right now. There's going to be three demos for the game available as the weeks commence. The demo number one is already available where you go through the first part of the game. Now there's a demo number two, which is part two of the game or, or of the of the demo essentially. So they're releasing these kind of episodically, I guess you could say, where uh, you know you get a part of the story. Maybe it get, you know you get like the initial like, um, oh that's you know the the initial like murder or whatever. Um, then you get like a little bit more where you're doing some detective work maybe. And the final one is probably going to be you know probably the you know uh, some sort of conclusion to the first chapter of the game maybe I don't know, but. Um, Pretty cool that they're releasing like these little demos for the game. So there's two demos available right now. Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 or Part 1 and Part 2. And the third demo will be available August 28th, a day before the game's release. So if you want to check that out, those will be av- those are available now and also soon. Caravan. I've talked about this game a couple times because they keep doing these little teasers and stuff like that. But now we officially have a release date for the game instead of a release window. And the release date is September 12th. Um, so you'll be able to play the game on September 12th. You drive a little 4x4 <coughs> caravan, van, or whatever. Um, this is coming to Switch, Xbox, PlayStation, PC. Um, there's a whole world to explore, post-apocalyptic world to explore. There's a diverse cast of characters. There, There's um, the accessibility options, of course. Lots of different characters in there. There's a frog man that was in the, the most recent trailer, which was kind of cute. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a sci-fi adventure where you... Use this little van to go around and do stuff, which uh, sounds kind of cool. So I'm looking forward to it. I'll probably pick it up, um, you know, eventually. And it's going to be available September 12th. A game called Fast Penguin, Fast with three A's, is coming to PlayStation. I don't know if it's coming to other consoles at this point, uh, but Fast Penguin is a free-to-play, kind of like a Fall guys S game, but instead of, you know, being jelly beans who are kind of hard to control i guess uh you are fast penguin type characters riding down slides and stuff slopes and stuff uh so um the game is going to have full cross pay play between all consoles so i guess there is multiple consoles in there um each match is going to be supported for up to 60 players you'll be able to join parties with your friends or play solo if you want to it's a free-to-play game but of course there's like skins and stuff you can buy i believe there's also going to be some sort of um you know, microtransaction version of a season pass in there. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's going to be four courses at launch. You'll slide down to the, to the finish line. You can tack your opponents along the way. If you're successful in the in the, in, in knocking someone off, it, off the track, you'll be launched into the sky, which will allow you to gain various advantages like finding shortcuts or upgrades or um, up upgrades. I don't, I don't, I don't think they meant to put that in there. Um, in other words, you'll, it's smart to be aggressive for this game. So, If you want to check that out, that's going to be available uh, in September this year. I believe it's already it might already be available for phones. I'm not sure, but uh, it's coming to console uh, in September. So if you want to check that out, there you go. And then finally, for games, uh, Kong Survivor, like King Kong Survivor, is a PS5, Xbox Series, PC uh, side-scrolling action game where you actually use Kong. To help you out, uh, so you play as like this uh, this little dude. Well, I guess it's normal side du- size dude, but little dude compared to Kong, in a Metroidvania type game where uh, you utilize the monarch technology to influence the titans of the world. Mainly, it looks like King Kong. Uh, so um, it's a 2.5D experience, and obviously there's lots of set pieces and stuff like that. It's a Metroidvania, so you really you'll be coming around to different areas multiple times. It seems like there's also regular combat in the game where you fight like uh, looters or whatever in the, in this destroyed city. 
Um, but yeah, Kong and other, I guess, other kaiju will be helping you out. In the press release, they said, take on the role of David, an oil rig worker braving a crumbling city to find his only child, Stacy. Make your way through the dis- districts while encountering fellow survivors taking shelter among the rubble, mourning their loved ones on or on the verge of giving up hope. Feel the awe-inspiring terror titans bring upon the city through the eyes of a father desperate to find his daughter. So it's essentially the plot of um, Godzilla 2014 or uh, Godzilla uh, King of Monsters. Uh, <laughs> obviously, this looks a lot better than the King Kong game we got last year. I don't know how much better it looks, but it does look better. So there's there's a silver lining there for you. That'll be available sometime later this year. And finally for today, here are 12 games leaving Game Pass. And uh, there's a lot of big ones on here that are leaving, including Alien Isolation, Cloud Punk, Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2, Horizon Forbidden West, Marvel's Midnight Suns, Near Replicant, Spiritfarer, Star Ocean First Departure R, Star Ocean Integrity and Faithlessness, Star Ocean The Divine Force, Star Ocean Lost Hope, and Star Ocean Till the End of Time. I'm not sure what those Star Ocean games are. They might be like packs for a main game. I don't know. Um, but uh, this is actually a, a decent list of games that have some good games in here that, that are leaving. Uh, Alien Isolation obviously uh, is a you know, is a is a pretty popular game in, in terms of survival horror games. And, and the, the latest Alien movie came out, Alien Romulus, which I really enjoyed. I thought it was really good. So I don't know why they would be removing it now out of all, all the times to remove it, but there you go. Cloud Punk is like a sci-fi taxi service kind of game where you meet characters and you taxi them around a sci-fi town. It's pretty fun. Um, Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2 is understandable because a new Dragon Ball game is coming out soon. Horizon Forbidden West is a weird one, kind of a head scratcher there. Um, it's possible they're removing it to add in, you know, the the uh, the complete edition of the game with the, the 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 big DLC for the game. It's possible that they're just taking it off to put that on. Um, that's 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 the that's the most likely thing that's happening with that. Uh, Marvel's Midnight Suns is also like a big one. That's a turn-based superhero fighting game. Um, it's not made by the same people. It's not made by Insomniac, so it's obviously a different game. But uh, it's, it's it's weird to see it leaving. But who knows? I don't know why. And then Near Replicant is also another one that's um that's a pretty big one. This was like a remaster of uh, one of the original Near games. So um you know it's, it's it's odd to see that one leaving as well because I'm pretty sure it was it's a pretty popular series, pretty popular game. So uh, there you go. All right, I know it's been a long one. Stick with me for a little bit longer as we do the song of the week. If you know the name of the song and the game that's from, let me know in the comments below, either on YouTube or join me in the Discord link below as well, uh, where in the Ferris 64 section you can tell me the name and the game that's from, and I'll give you a super reaction and a hearty congratulations. Um, let's see what this week's song is right now. I meant hear or listen, but you, you know what I meant. Uh, if you know the name of the song, game it came from, let me know in the comments below or in the Discord. I'd appreciate that. All right, folks, thank you for sticking with me through this longer episode of the podcast. We had a lot of stuff to go over, but I hope it was fun. I hope it was uh, some good information in there. Um, once again, if you could, leave a like on the video or a rating on Spotify and or a review on Apple Podcasts. I would appreciate that. I have put the podcast on many more platforms, so if you're on any of those platforms, I appreciate you listening and, and or watching the show. Season 3 is in full swing now. I hope you've liked the new artwork for the for the podcast. I also hope that you like the new intro, outro, and stuff like that. I've worked pretty hard to try and update everything to make sure that Season 3 goes as smooth as it possibly can. I hope you've also been enjoying the video version of the podcast on YouTube, where I'm actually here talking and showing things on screen. I have hope you've been having fun with that. Any feedback is valuable, unless it's something trolly, then I'll just block you. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you want to check out the other podcasts that I do, Film Freaks with a Z at the end. We talk about movies. The latest episode is about Twister and kind of like and and kind of Twisters, the new one. Uh, but we talked about that. Uh, the next episode will air in two weeks. But until then, you got Twister, the, the Twister conversation to listen to. 
Also, I stream on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturdays right now doing the Backlog Bonanza, um, uh, Summer Bonanza. Uh, we've been doing it throughout the entire, you know, since uh, since June all the way through August. We're almost done with it. Uh, we'll be ending like the first week of September, but if you want to join in for that, uh, it's been a lot of fun. We've been doing marble races and, and all this kind of stuff, playing games on off my Backlog at random. So it's been pretty fun. A little bit frustrating here and there, but pretty fun. And other than that, uh, if you want to check me out anywhere else, it's all at Yummy the Ferret, whether it be YouTube, YouTube Vaz channel, uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, etc. It's all at Yummy the Ferret. And I appreciate you once again for listening to this episode. I am Yummy the Ferret, and I am out of here. Have a good week or weekend. I'll see you next time. Bye bye. The Ferret 64 podcast is owned and edited by Yummy the Ferret. Small sound clips used throughout the podcast were made by Yemi the Ferret. The song in the intro and outro is Nightshade by Adhesive Wombat. The Ferret 64 logo was made by Player2P2. News sources include PushSquare.com, NintendoLife.com, and PureXbox.com. All opinions, video game related, are my own. Thank you for listening.